Good evening, everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the Board of Selectmen meeting for the Town of Hingham for Thursday, August 22nd. Um, we were just in an executive session when we opened the meeting at 645 with regard to litigation to the Aquarian Water Company. We'll have a statement tomorrow. Um, we will release uh, a document that will be for the public's uh, 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 review. And we'll make that sometime tomorrow afternoon, I, I believe. Um, we have minutes to approve this evening. We have an application for a common victualler wine and malt license from Peel Holding, a petition to change the manager at Plaza Azteca on Route 53, a public hearing on National Grid to install and maintain approximately 80 feet of gas main. We also have a public hearing from Aquarian to install and maintain uh, some, um, some water on Abington Street. A petition for a change of manager for the Black Rock Country Club. Uh, and then uh, those, three item, those five items should not take us too long, uh, but then we'll go into a report at 7.30 for the FOSS Committee of the Veterans Council to memorialize Hingham's only, um, Hingham's only Medal of Honor winner uh, Seaman Herbert Foss. We'll get, as promised, an update on the North Street sewer issue. And then at 8 o'clock, the major issue will be a discussion, a continuing. This will be session three on the discussion concerning Hingham's relationship with Plymouth County and what should we do, if anything, regarding that relationship. And then we'll talk later about uh, an issue that's come up in the last few weeks concerning animals and bicycles in the building, the discussion about appointments and selectmen and town reports, and that's it. So with that, I'd like to um, uh, get a motion to approve the minutes of August 1st. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We have uh, Peel Holding. Do we have a representative from Peel Holding? If you would, come sit and join us. Tell us uh, who, who you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brendan Higgins, manager of Peel Pizza Company. Okay. And you're here for uh, for what purpose? For, to get a license for for wine and malt. Wine and malt. Okay. Why do you need a license? Well, uh, we've gotten a lot of requests from customers who want a beer with their pizza or a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one became available, and I thought it would be a good fit for our food and for our restaurant. Okay. Um, uh, we've been informed that uh, you've passed a Corey check and that your tip's qualified? Yes, sir. That's okay. I'll open up to my colleagues for discussion. Irma? Uh, is everyone in the restaurant tips trained? Um, no, the cooks are not. Um, I have an assistant manager who will be okay, soon. But is not yet. No, not yet. Just me so far. Okay. That's... <clears throat> Mr. Healy? Uh, good evening, sir. Do you have any other restaurants or pizza operations where you have a beer and wine license? No, sir. Is this the only one that you operate? Yes. And uh, would you be on site? Uh, for the majority of the hours that it's open? Yes, I already am. Yeah, I'm there all the time. <coughs> Do you have experience in with previous restaurants where alcohol is served? Yes, I do. Okay. Yep, I have plenty of experience. I've worked in a, in, in a lot of restaurants over the years. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Could you elaborate on what that experience consists of? Um, I used to work at um, the Stockyard Restaurant in Brighton a long time ago. Um, I worked with Cassidy. the... Uh, I'm sorry? In what capacity? Um, I was a bar back and a, sort of a waiter. I helped out a lot. And then um, I was with the Upper Crust for years. And um, now Peel. Okay. Um, Mr. Alexiades, did the Upper Crust restaurant have a beer license? No. Um, I'm not aware, but. Oh. I don't think so. I don't know. No. 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 Okay. But you assume that uh, operation. <coughs> Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. I know the location. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Any questions from the public? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. 
Uh, Irma? You want me to? Okay. Sure, thank you. I make a motion to approve the application for a restaurant, common victualler, wine, and malt by Peel Holding Incorporated, doing business as Peel Pizza Company, 73 South Street, Hingham. Brendan Higgins, manager, subject to the approval of all town boards and departments. Submission of a valid certificate of insurance evidencing liquor legal liability insurance coverage in at least the minimum statutory amounts and the approval of the Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. I'll we'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good luck, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, sir. Okay. Have a good evening. Excuse me, maybe Lincoln Department of Residence be excused. Certainly. Okay, by, by all means. And we'll, and we'll catch you uh, in a, in, as soon as we get the information you requested. Thank you for coming. Um, do we have the uh, uh, representative from Plaza Azteca? Oh, okay, there you are. You're back. Sure. You might want to bring a grab a chair there. So uh, I drove by there the other day, and I you got the name up, so we know where it is. Yeah, I know where it is. Houston, which it is, yeah. I'm getting there, getting there. Okay. Yes, sir. You're here for. Okay. My name is Juan Melendez. Uh, I'm here to request the liquor license. You know, the manager. Um, yeah, my name is Juan Melendez. I'm the, I'll, I'll be one of the managers in Plaza Azteca, and I'm here to request the liquor license. Okay. Well, change of yeah, change, 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 This is what you told her. us you were coming back to yes. tell us. Yeah. Right. Okay. All of them. Okay. Irma, any question? Usual questions. Are you tips trained? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Healy, a minute to Paul to. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to America as your citizenship. I see you've got citizenship in 2008. Is that right? Is that right? Thank well, welcome you. aboard. Thank you. Um, have you served as a manager in any of the other uh, Azteca restaurants? Yes, I'm right now in Metuel, Massachusetts, in all the Plaza Azteca. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going right now with her. The and when uh, the South Hingham operation opens up, will you be on site there 40 hours a week? I'll be there all the time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other changes we should be made aware of? I think no, that's, that's it. pretty much it. Okay, and your planned opening date is? Do you well, have one yet? Hopefully, once we get you know everything squared up, the training uh, for the staff we already started it. You know, little by little. Once we get approved and everything from the Boston, I mean from Massachusetts, the commissioner. I will say in the next two weeks, hopefully. Good. So right so after. A lot, a lot of work, work being, being done, done down, down there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, those signs have to get used, you know, so <laughs> that's a good thing. Okay, I'll entertain a motion on the change of manager. I'll uh, move to approve the change of manager for Plaza Azteca, Hingham, DBA, Plaza Azteca, Mexican restaurant from Antonio Melendez to Ibaldo Melendez. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good luck. Good luck, Thank fellas. You. Thank you so Thank much. You. <clears throat> okay. All right. We. Um, okay. Um, Seven eighteen, so we're a little behind on the public hearing of National Grid to install and maintain approximately 80 feet, more or less, of two-inch mass gain on Whitcomb Avenue. Hingham as a replacement. Welcome back, Dennis. Good evening. Good. My me. name is Dennis Regan. I'm the permit representative from National Grid, and tonight National Grid respectfully requests your consent to install and maintain approximately 80 feet more or less of 2-inch gas main in Whitcomb Ave, Hingham. From the existing 2-inch gas main at House 18 Southerly to House Number 24 for a new gas service. Okay. Any specific issues associated with this that are unique? I'll ask uh, our highway superintendent, Mr. Sylvester, do you have any comments? Uh, no, this is a standard procedure. Um, should be maybe two days worth of work at best. And um, <clears throat> all the specifications are uh, 
pretty much uh, uniform. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Irma? No issues with the road moratorium or anything with what can have? No, none of this well. Replacing the, or adding gas line 100 feet at a time? Or? Well, it's, we're not allowed to, we're only allowed to do what, 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 exactly what we're supposed to use. Okay. It's a deregulation rule. So if you're place. solicited, you'll go through this process and? Yes. Okay. okay. So I think at okay. some point we're just going to make a little office for you here. That would be fine. I wouldn't have to go through the traffic it takes to get here. <laughs> well, you're helping the economy when you do that. So that's, uh, well, I'll accept that. Okay. Is, is there already gas on Whitcomb Ave? If there's gas on Whitcomb Ave, that, that stops right at House 18. Okay. Wow. And that's the bridge. That we, you obviously, if you have more... Um, more customers that solicit you'd have to go for other extensions is that uh, yes <coughs> okay any other questions any questions from the public yes uh, good evening my name is john hersey um dennis i want to ask you a question um did you um have permission to open up beale street are you involved in beale street number 80 is that you, it, 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 because I have, I am only right now. On Excuse me, Mr. Hersey, yeah. that's not on the table this evening. If you well, like it's a gas company, and I'm asking him because it says it says talking about Whitcomb Avenue this evening. I understand that, but it's but we have a public hearing on Whitcomb Avenue. We have a public hearing. Bill Beale Street is not part of that hearing. At, okay. At, at what point could Beale Street be put on the agenda to we discuss? Can, we can bring Beale Street up. And a future agenda, September fifth. Let's do that. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Any other questions on Whitcomb Avenue? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I think. Uh, My turn. I move that we approve the petition of National Grid to install and maintain approximately 80 feet, more or less, of two-inch gas main in Whitcomb Ave, Hingham, from the existing two-inch gas main at house number 18, southerly to house number 24, for a new gas service. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, when I was here at the last meeting, um, I was given homework by one of the counselors. And I have an answer to the question that was asked. We have 96.2 miles of gas main in the town of Hingham, and we have 76.4 miles of gas service in the town of Hingham. And that gas service length is made up of the 4,071 services that are in the town of Hingham. Thank you. Welcome. That's 4, excellent. 4,072 now, I guess. <laughs> Thank right. you. I Thank was you curious because you're putting it in everywhere. Yes, yes. And doing are. a nice job, actually. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. No big booms. Okay, Aquarian. Do we have a representative from Aquarian? Mr. Walsh. John, if you could introduce yourself and your compatriot to the audience at home, thank you. I'm John Walsh, Vice President of Operations for Aquarian. Uh, Blake Lucas, Manager of Supply Operations for Aquarian. And you are here for? Uh, we are pleased to be here tonight uh, requesting a grant of location for a water main extension on Abington Street. Uh, this is approximately 380 feet of 12-inch ductile iron being installed from the driveway at 105 Research Road to uh, number 74 Abington Street. Okay. The project also includes a new fire hydrant uh, in front of the property 74 Abington. Okay. Um, Harry, any? Sure. Abington Street is a favorite of mine, as you know. Um, we have some citizens where previous work was not done to our satisfaction, so maybe you could comment, not by these folks. Um, any issues that we should be aware of? In, in terms well, Abington Street um, was uh, accelerated to the road construction list this, this season. Um, and we were making plans to uh, you know, resurface the road um, when 
the uh, property owner at 74 Abingdon Street wished to uh, hook up the water or bring the water up to his property. So um, we've, uh, you know, delayed that project till next year. And uh, it's better to have it done now than squabble five years about trying to get water to the property. Okay. Is there any other properties up there that are going to be in need of water? That um, Abington Rock and Water comes down, I think it was with a one or one and a half inch water main. It's in a plastic, I think, electrical conduit that was put in there in the 60s. Um, because the wells are going dry, and that goes down three quarters of the way, I believe. Most residents are feeding off that, so um, now that there's another option, uh, and there's, I know there's some potential development on that road, um, we'll see what happens, uh, you know, once this water main's, you know, installed, and maybe there'll be some, um, you know, some uh, interest in extending that again. So we'll be, you know, what, we'll look out for that. Is that, if I can ask the, for another question, this potential development is, um, um, do we expect a decision on this potential be becoming actual at some time in a reasonable time frame, or do you know? Not well, there was some property up there that was really, uh, you know, had a hot interest in uh, development. It was a small condominium complex or apartment complex, uh, you know, further up towards the uh, Sharp Street end. Um, but the draw one drawback was they couldn't provide fire protection off the existing water main that was in the ground. Um, I haven't heard from that developer in a number of years now, two or three years, so I'm not sure where that project holds. But now there's another source of water that could, you know, heat up again. And there was another project at the end they were going to put a well in, I guess, um, to suit their needs. So, you know, some of these developments make, you know, once there's water there and there's a, need, there's a uh, you know, a source, they may heat up in conversation again, so we'll be looking at that. Okay. If I may, um, we actually did call the three closest um, abutters to 74 Abington um, since they were only a few hundred feet down the road to see if there was any interest in having them, um, working with them to try to continue the water main, this water main project a little bit further in order to tie them in as well. Um, I left messages with all three homeowners and I would, uh, have not received any phone calls back, unfortunately. And when would you start this work, John? Uh, with this fall. It's a developer-driven project, so he controls the schedule to some extent, but he is indicating that he would like uh, the main installed in the fall. Would that give you some time to contact these other three people, maybe a little bit more aggressively, because it would strike me that it would be much more efficient to do them all at once? Absolutely. And then I, I assume you'd have to come back here, but it would... Yep it would strike me that it might be the best for everybody to do it at once. Good, good suggestion. Paul? Why isn't the water company installing a line right up to the end of uh, Abington Street where it meets Sharp Street? Uh, that, we are not allowed to extend water main um, on the backs of our existing customers, so developers uh, the typical way that the system gets expanded is developers request uh, us to extend the water main and they fund the water main extension. So you don't pay for any increase in the water main line at all, ever? Well, any, uh, any water main has to be either paid for by a new developer or through the existing rates. What would it cost to extend the line to Shop Street on Abington Street? Uh, we're typically in the 170 to 250 dollars a foot cost for water main installation. So I don't know what the length is to the end of that. What's the length? I don't know the exact length, but um, what's your I'll best approximation? Two and a half to three miles. What? I think maybe I'm misunderstanding. That's from, the Rockland from side. 105 Research Road to where it comes out on a Abington Street to Sharp Street. That's about eight tenths of a mile. I was there. Um, Sorry. And you tend to resurface Abington Street? Yeah, and that's one of the roads that were accelerated because of the condition of it, yes. Wouldn't it make more sense to put a line in there so you could put water up to Dennis Road, Hickey Road, what is it, Springwood up there? Yeah. That they're, they're all well-fed homes, right? No, they were uh, fed by the Abington Rockland uh, Water Company through a one-inch electrical conduit for sake of argument. Uh, it's really undersized, but the last time this one was pursued, 
I believe Aquarian was trying to make a deal with Abington Rock and Water to bring water from that end or with uh, the town of Weymouth and both deals fell through. The residents had no interest in that hooking up to Aquarian at the time it was being discussed. Would you opine that that's an inadequate water line feeding those neighborhoods? I do not know what that Rabington Rockland water line is. Well, no. if, assuming what he says is accurate, would you agree that that's inadequate? A one inch line? Yes. Correct. Okay. Mm. Uh, excuse me, Harry, if I may, there's someone in the audience who has some. Okay. Would you like to comment on this issue? Yes, I may. If, if I could ask Harry to just step aside for a minute. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. Just tell us who you are and Sorry. tell the folks at home. My name Thanks. is Margaret McNeil. I live on 40 Abington Street. Those three homes you have contacted, they're on the water line already. Marshall's Crimes. I think Messina's home is not. Okay. That's probably why they didn't return your calls. So we have a two inch plastic pipe that comes down and feeds 13 residents on Abington Street. And then Springfield has their own water line from Rockland. And then the water line comes down, goes up in Hickey Road, and feeds the neighbors up there. Okay. Um, as is a two inch plastic pipe, it's not a one inch. And it does take care of us very well. Are you in favor of this? Or? Well, my only concern was um, they're running the water line over to a set of woods. So I'm assuming that woods is being developed. And we were just informed now that our street that was supposed to be paved this year is not going to get paved. So we're concerned of all the traffic that's going to come. I know this is not the forum for this. But now it's open up to what's going to happen to that street with all the cars that's going to come out of this proposal Do and where they're going to go. I mean, if you guys been down Abbott Street, it's very narrow. There's no sidewalks. My husband's blind. He can't even walk on the street. You know, so it's just. No, I'm very familiar. There's a, <clears throat> there are some people who use Abington Street for commutation, and uh, I would say it wasn't a pleasant experience uh, that they had. Am I saying that right? Yes. I think yeah. you would. Yeah. So that's my concern because we've been anxious to get this done. So um, we have what a short period. Uh, you don't know when this is going to happen, uh, is what I'm hearing, John. Yeah. Well, the paving is happening. I was told in 2014. That's not really a question, sir. As you run a water line to the woods, 74 Avenue Street's woods. There's not anything there. So we're assuming now, as residents, that something's being built there. Yeah, there's a developer who's asked for the water main extension who, and who's paying for the water main extension. I do not know what he's building there uh, at this time. Harry, is this um, John Barry property that we're talking about? Yes. So he, he doesn't have a development in place right now. He had one in 2008. If you remember in the, the really original discussions, um, he could not get water. Excuse me, sir. That gentleman went bankrupt. The bank now owns all that property. It's not my understanding, but... Yeah, um, that's when the residents who lives right next to him had told us. Well, we, we've been speaking with Mr. Barry, so, I, you know, maybe, maybe there are some other financial arrangements I'm not aware of, but he had the property uh, slated to be developed as a storage facility and um, uh, closed on the property, began development, had a commitment from Aquarian to put in water, to allow him to access water through Weymouth, and then Aquarian said no after the development and essentially killed the development. And John's aware of it. John helped correct it by working on this problem now to make sure that he has water the next time he wants to develop. And okay. So I don't know if it's a development that certainly nothing in front of the planning board, nothing's been filed, but he does intend to develop it at some point. How, how big's the parcel of land? I think it was supposed to be a 20,000 square foot warehouse, if I'm correct. Uh, the acreage that he sits on. I, I, I don't know. How are you? How are you? Are we at what property? Are you talking about 74? Are you talking about the gym on that property? No, no. At the end of the street, that's that's Rockland, isn't it? Harry, uh, right, which one am I talking about? No it's, idea it's one down the Pine Street. Yeah, right. it, it's an undeveloped site um, next to the existing home uh, opposite the uh, driveway to the new school. And in uh, the late 2000s, the planning board in Hingham oh, conducted site plan design. review on a project there. But that's the developer who's paying for the water main, right? Right. right. But that, that is the developer who's paying for the main. I thought you were talking about the one at the other end of the street. No. Okay. I apologize. That's right, what no we were talking about. We're just concerned that, um, I guess we're a little now discouraged because the town's been promised us to do our street over, and now we've just been informed that we're going to get put off again because of this. And it's just... 
it's not an indefinite postponement. It's a one year because the worst thing we could do is pave it and then cut it. And we really try not to do that as, as much as we possibly can. We know that's not, it's impossible to avoid that all the time, but. So basically, really there's no proposal that's going in there. It's just someone wants to get a water main set so they can start the. Correct. So then I guess we have to bring a press file issues at the next form. Planning board. Planning. Hingham Planning Board. All right. Yeah, the issue, the concern for me would be that someone comes forward after, too late, after. Um, so whoever it is, I, I think it behooves you to come back to us and let us know what the plan is because <coughs> Harry will be under pressure to do this sooner rather than later. And if that developer wants to insert himself in this process, they better do it pretty quick. Uh, my concern, though, is um, in addition to that, is, is the fire suppression capability of the Hingham Fire Department on those homes up there. I, I don't think there's enough pressure to really fight a fire um, if one of those houses goes up. And before the road gets repaved, I think it's the time to start talking about putting a main down there and extend the line. We're definitely open to that discussion, recognizing that there's factors um, including rates when you install water main um, as I said developers pay for main extensions and uh, water main replacements um, we take care of those and they go into rates but extensions are fire hydrants John is correct you know he as a as a private uh, as an investor owned utility um, <coughs> they are regulated by DEP uh, DEP DPU and they cannot put a water main in um, prospectively, um, someone has to pay for it. Um, so that's one of the issues of investor-owned utilities. So the main you're putting in here would not service the residents. Well, maybe you don't want it now, but if you have to fight a fire, you may change your mind. And I don't know enough about what's down there, but to Paul's point, I would certainly agree with what he's saying. I guess my, the concern being is you're putting an additional expense burden on the residents are in cap water lines in there. Something we put in there in 64 and you want to take away from us. It's a private water line. You know, it's, I mean, now who, who takes on the burden of running this main down the whole road? It's not like we came to the town because we, our wells are dried up, we have no water. We have water. We pay Rockland Avenue Waterworks for our water and we maintain our own line. We own it privately. As I said, we're definitely willing to talk to town officials and uh, customers and uh, residents. And if folks are interested in extending the water line, uh, we definitely entertain that option. What I'm hearing right now from the select residents who are here um, is they're not interested in it, but it's not all the residents on the street. So we'd be willing to have that discussion with everyone in that area. Any other comments? No, I think we're good. Um, yes, ma'am. Would you like? Would you come up here, please? Yes, Thank you. Ahead. Sandra Durth, 36 Abington Street. For the future, I'd like if Aquarian could notify all 13 water holders on the street instead of just the three up the other end, because it affects all of us. Um, if appreciate that, and um, financially, if. It's, it's going to be a big burden because most of us on that street aren't, um, no, I won't get into that. But anyway, um, for us to pay to have that water main take from 74 all the way to Sharp Street is a very big expense. So we're not looking forward to that. We do. And it is a two-inch pipe, and it, um, it's got a blow-off at the other end near 74. When you're digging up the street, you've got to really be careful. We don't want to have to pay for any damage that Aquarian has done. Um, also, it can't be a dead end pipe, but you know that already, right? I mean, you guys know what you're doing, so you know that it can't be if you do that um, hydrant. The hydrant would be, so it wouldn't be a dead end, right? Because right now there's a, a dead end on Abington Street, but they've changed that, so there is a T to, to blow it off from and hang Oh, we have a blow off on the end of You will it. have, okay. Um, I think Margaret covered just about everything. I kept writing and she kept speaking, so <laughs> she just she just covered everything. Good. Um, if you just um, let all of us know, the on Abington Street appreciated. I didn't get a letter. I got it from Margaret. She. Okay. I didn't get a letter from the floor. 
if I could be notified next time, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to say something. Surely. My name is Charlotte Rice, and I live on Hickey Road. Um, I don't mind a water pipe being put up the street. I just don't want to be forced on it. There are people on that street that probably would like to be on that water pipe, but I don't want to be forced off my private line and have to take their water. We so already have a water line. So, that so suits us fine. My water pressure is great. But I don't mind if they put a water pipe up the street. I just don't want to be forced on it. I'm pretty sure that the water uh, line extensions are very similar to the sewer line extensions. Somebody has to pay for it. But just like in sewers, you don't necessarily have to connect to it. Um, but you'd have to pay for it if it runs by your street, uh, by your house, uh, if you desire to have it. So generally, a developer comes in, like Mr. Healy is suggesting, and they develop a, an area of town, and they pay to have the water line brought into all those homes. The developer who developed your area, long gone, so if the pipe, if you were coming to us asking for the pipe, Aquarian would have to charge you collectively, divide it up amongst you, and I just did a rough calculation based on what Harry says, and you're talking about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars to run that that pipe. That's yeah, not exactly uh, a small sum of money for a small group of homes to have to pay for. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and again, like I said, as an investor-owned utility, this is not a choice they have. They can't just willingly say, "Sure, we're just going to use it on the rates." Um, they can't do that. They have to charge for it. That's fine. Well, I know you were saying, why can't we just run it up the top of the street? They can run it anywhere they want to. I just don't want to be forced onto it. So it sounds like, um, I'm, I welcome comments from my colleagues, but it sounds like, John, you've done research with some of the abutters, not all. Correct. And since this could imply uh, if we were to do what the longer term plan might be, that we could have a problem creating for the, some of the local homeowners who may not be in support of this. Am I saying that right? Uh, I'm not sure I followed you. The problem for who? The problem for people who don't want to be on a line that's going to be in front of their house and they're going to be forced to pay. Well, no, that's not happening now. Right. No, I understand that now. But there's 13 other people. Is that separate from this issue? We just heard that not everybody was notified. Oh, I see what you're saying. It typically, what we follow is the no, standard right procedure right. where we notify abutters, but in this case, recognizing that there are folks further on down the street who aren't abutters, um, we'll be more mindful in the future of making sure that folks like you are notified. But what you're approving tonight won't affect, affect that. the abutters. Okay. If future contact between Aquarian and the abutters or the other, other residents on Abington Street um, um, culminates or comes to an agreement that they want a water line, then they would have to pay for it. If they don't want it, then that's obvious. They're not going to get it. Okay. And if I remember more, sewer discussions, that's a majority vote of the people? If um, I'm not as familiar about that. Sewer is usually a super majority because they're usually tied to debt issues and you go to town meeting to get that approved. Um, in this case, we wouldn't. This would be a private agreement between the homeowners and Aquarium. Okay. And I mean, if one homeowner wanted to pay $800,000, then, I mean, Aquarian just wants the 800000 to put the pipe in. You know, they don't really care where it comes from. So, you know, if they all want to divide it equally, great. If they want, one person wants to be uh, magnanimous and pay for the whole thing, <laughs> everyone else wouldn't have to pay for it. But it's, the rules are different for them than they would be for us as a municipality. All right, so we're, yes, I'll take a motion on this one. Thank you. Move to, to approve the petition of Aquarium to install and maintain approximately 380 linear feet of new 12-inch diameter cement line, duct line, and water main and associated valves and fittings on Abington Street Hangham. The water main will be a continuation of a main originating at Research Road and continuing through private property at 105 Research Road to Abington Street. This main is being installed to provide future water service to the 74 Abington Street property. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, John. And I guess, John, you'll, I know you'll come back to us if there's yes. further developments. Okay, Great. thank you. Bruce, if we could, before Harry leaves, um, I really would like to have 80 Beale Street on an agenda in the future. You are, you, yeah, we're... Uh, well, uh, I did some research after driving down Beale Street and seeing the two huge curb cuts into the street. And we've heard repeatedly here that 
under a five-year moratorium unless it's an emergency we don't do the curb cuts. So I owe the Hurleys a rather large apology because I had known we were doing curb cuts. I would certainly not have taken the stand because we've taken a position here that the five-year moratorium is pretty much sacred. So if we could discuss that, I'd like that. Yeah. Ted? The, the Board of Selectmen and Ms. Lauder signed an agreement with the developers of um, the Beale Street property um, and that development agreement included the right to cut the curb regardless of the moratorium. So even though the Board has a policy of not granting, as you remember fully well with the Hurleys on Kimball Beach Road, the Board could have easily voted to grant that. They decided not to, to stay consistent with the policy. Um, and the board voted as part of the development agreement with Craftsman Village to allow three, cur three cuts regardless. So the developer is following forth with an agreement that the board already granted. But that never came before the board of selectmen. Sure it did. The board of selectmen it signed it. It, yes. it was a part of the comprehensive it was, permit it was, as well. It was part of the comprehensive permit that the board of selectmen agreed to. And when was this? Because uh, I dug out all the... 2011 or 10. Okay, 11 and 10, signed. and Harry signed the paperwork on <laughs> Halloween of 2012. So 10-31-2012, two, two, I've got that. I think that would have been helpful during the Hurley discussion. Okay. Because I mean, we heard never, except under emergency, do we do a curb cut. And like now said, we're going to have an, three of them. It was an agreement signed by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. okay. Ed, Harry, you want to comment? A permit wasn't signed for the properties until just, um, I think, within the last uh, month, maybe a little longer. It was a letter drawn up, a draft I was asked to draw up for road restoration that I think was dated uh, Halloween. I think that's where a little yes. confusing. I didn't sign any permits back there in October. That road still wasn't cut. It was my wishful thinking that. It wasn't going to be cut because there were some other avenues that were, uh, were explored um, before, um, you know, it was they ended up cutting the road. But uh, that's all I want to add as far as that goes. Okay. Thank you both. Thanks, Harry. Um, we have a uh, change of manager from the Black Rock Country Club. Are they? Yes, sir. Cornwall, looking to take over the. Uh, I've been promoted food and beverage director, and I'm looking to take over the liquor license over Alex Noskovich, who is leaving us. And um, in anticipation of Irma's question. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> Am I tip yeah, I don't want you to take all eight. <laughs> I don't want you to take all eight. Uh, your tip straight. Yes, sir. Yeah. Corey, check. Yes, sir. Okay. No questions. No questions. That's no questions. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. A motion, Irma. Okay, I move to approve the petition for a change of manager for Black Rock Country Club LLC from Alex Noskovich. Noskovich, yes. <laughs> to Brad Cornwall. Second. Any it's further discussion? Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, we're a little bit behind, but um, where did Mr. I'm looking. I'm looking for Mr. Claypool. He is here. I saw, I saw him duck his I head in. Here. here he comes. Um. Next uh, group is coming in. Just for. Let me see. Uh. Getting hot in here, Sharon. Go. Go. I appreciate it. We'll have some more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Have a seat. Welcome. I promise not to slap you on the back. As <laughs> there's some seats over here. Yeah, come over here. It's like an usher, Mr. Chairman. We need a church, you know. <laughs> Jim, Nobody you, wants to sit up front. Yeah. Jim, I know you have good training in ushering. That's yes, it. I do. I do. That's it. Uh, this is a session that. We've been working on the boards of selectmen, I should say, concerning how should the town of Hingham celebrate and memorialize the life of Seaman Herbert Foss. And about some time ago, 
Um, we asked uh, Jim Claypool to, as chairman of the Veterans Council at the time, but also to put a group together to study what was the best method to do that. So I will turn the uh, floor over to Mr. Claypool. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Ms. Lauder and uh, uh, Paul Healy, uh, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, come before you this evening and to present the findings of the FOSS Committee. Uh, last week, the Veterans Council voted unanimously to endorse the uh, position of the FOSS Committee, which was to unanimously recommend to the Board of Selectmen that we rename the Town Hall, the Herbert L. FOSS Town Hall. And tonight, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have with us uh, a large contingency of the FOSS family, so I would like you, if you would, please, to rise to uh, uh, <coughs> give the Board of Selectmen a uh, feel for your presence. Just stand up, please. Hi. Welcome. Well. Wow. Nice. And, and we have also with us the matriarch of the family, who's the granddaughter of Seaman Foss. Her name is Harriet uh, Kirkpatrick. So Harriet, would you rise, please? She is the granddaughter of Herbert L. Foss. Um, I, I know you're probably running behind, Mr. Chairman, so uh, uh, I'll give you a brief background of the Medal of Honor for those who may uh, not be fully aware of the magnitude of this uh, this fabulous award. It's the uh, highest military decoration that can be awarded to any member of the armed forces of the United States. It had its origin in the Civil War and there were from the end of the Civil War until the present time uh, 1939 of these medals awarded for valor to members of the armed forces of the United States and during that period we had uh, approximately 41 million men and women under arms. So this represents one Medal of Honor for every 21 plus thousand people who served in the armed forces of this great nation. Uh, Seaman Foss was one of the few uh, recipients of the Medal of Honor during the Spanish-American War. He served on the light cruiser uh, USS Marblehead and during the uh, interdiction of fire and the communications between Cuba and Spain, the Marblehead was assigned a mission to cut the communications cable between Cape, uh, Cuba and Spain to interdict the ability of Spain to uh, direct its uh, armed forces in that sector of the country. So the Marblehead and F Seaman Foss and his compatriots pulled the cable up out of the sea and under intense fire from the enemy, Foss cut that cable with a hacksaw. Under severe fire, many of his compatriots were wounded, and for that act of valor, he was uh, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So I think that uh, we are privileged to have one Medal of Honor winner in this town, and I would suspect that we probably won't have any more because of the uh, rare occasions in which this medal is uh, is granted to those who serve. The uh, background of how the how we came to our conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I think is appropriate for us to review. Uh, we we first in October established a criterion upon which we uh, felt that the uh, location for uh, the Medal of Honor honoring Seaman Foss would be appropriate, and I believe you have a copy of that criterion in your, uh, in your file. But just to summarize it, we wanted to have a pedestrian traffic with heavy uh, uh, pedestrian traffic. We wanted to be uh, conducive to uh, a, a kiosk where we could teach the young folks of the community who go by it all the time what the Medal of Honor is all about and uh, why it's important for us to understand what it is. Um, we wanted the location to be a, of significant prominence uh, and it would be, we hope to be a lasting memorial for the, uh, to commemorate the uh, tremendous act of valor which Seaman Foss undertook during the uh, uh, 1890 some period when he was awarded this honor. We first looked at the waterfront area and Ted was instrumental in helping us uh, 
uh, evaluate many of the sites down there, as was Alan Peralta, who is a member of the committee. And I should say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, three of our members uh, are not present this evening. Two of them are on vacation, uh, Ramsey and Finney. And the third, Alan Peralt, is uh, enrolling his uh, son in, a, I think, the University of Miami down in Florida. So you uh, know all about One that. One of our arch rivals. Yes, by the that's way. right. Well, it may have cost you a vote, Jim. <laughs> yeah, that, that will cost him some yeah. votes. And um, the, uh, my uh, compatriot here, Art Smith, is with me this evening. Are we uh, appropriately? You're, you're good. I'm just taking care of you, Jim. Okay, thank you very much. You always do, Ted. I appreciate sure that. You sound great for the Yeah, time. that's good. So, um, so we, we established the criterion. We evaluated the sites. We then procured from the Historical Commission this map, which represents 70 some municipal locations of property in this community. We went through all of them. Uh, there's about 75 locations of municipal property located and indicated on this map. We evaluated most of them. Uh, Forty some of them are named after people. We came down to about four locations that fit the criterion. And two weeks ago the uh, FOSS committee voted unanimously to recommend to the Board of Selectmen that the town rename the town hall the Herbert L. FOSS Town Hall. Now this is only one of three steps we need to take. We need to talk to the uh, Historical Commission, make a presentation to them. Uh, we need to draw up an article for the uh, town meeting for 2014 and by majority vote the town meeting will determine uh, whether or not our recommendation is um, accepted. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the Board of Selectmen tonight uh, vote to uh, support the recommendation of the FOSS Committee so that we can carry to the uh, Historical Commission an affirmative vote and they of course would ask, well what do the selectmen think? So I want to be able to tell them. Okay. okay. Um, Paul, do you give you a chance to go first? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you Mr. Claypool uh, and thank you to the FOSS family for coming tonight. Um, must be a, a proud a thing that I'm envious of that you have a, an ancestor who's won such a, a not one earned um, an award of this magnitude. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the Medal of Honor was something that was uh, developed by Abraham Lincoln uh, during the Civil War, and uh, it's it's gone through a, a very interesting history, and I strongly recommend it um, to anybody that. Uh, is interested. Uh, the war that, uh, Spanish-American war that Seaman Foss uh, earned his medal um, was reviewed subsequently that, to that time in 1917 and the award stood when um, the commission that was put in place to assess the, uh, the merit of some of the awards uh, resulted in quite a few of them being taken away. Um, I've had the privilege of um, meeting a, a gentleman who earned the Medal of Honor. Um, he's still alive. A lot of, a lot of the recipients uh, receive it posthumously. Um, you know, the, the criterion, as I understand it, and I'm perhaps not reciting it completely accurately, but you, it's an act that's performed uh, which, if looked upon, a person who decided not to perform that act would not be thought less of. It, it's, it's so considerable in terms of the bravery and courage that is displayed. Um, so the fact that we have a resident who's earned that award, it, to me, is significant and should be embraced and appropriately recognized. Um, I support the recommendation uh, made by the committee. I think it's a, an excellent one. Uh, we have a focal point down in the uh, hallway downstairs already, which recognizes veterans and Seaman Foss's contribution in particular. And I think this is just a natural progression. It would be an enduring one, and I think that the community uh, would embrace it. Um, the only area that I don't agree with Mr. Claypool is 
I do think that there are men and women serving in uniform today um, that are quite capable, and I'm talking about Hingham residents, that are quite capable of earning the Medal of Honor if the situation arose. Um, and I would also like to point out that one of our uh, departed residents, uh, James Cadigan, was nominated uh, by his commanding officer for the Medal of Honor um, at the Battle of Zurf in Germany in April of 45. So yes, it, it is a significant honor. Um, I, I hope that the town sees fit to uh, do this. I think it's a great idea and I'll stop there. Okay. <clears throat> Paul, that was well said. Very well said. Irma? Um, in the interest of time, I want to thank the Veterans Council for their journey and their deliberations in finding an appropriate building. I too like the town hall. Um, it's right out there and everybody sees it. We have very heavy traffic in here. So it is a fitting place. And there are, to Paul's point, there are numbers of books that talk about the Medal of Honor winners and they're worth reading because this is the common man performing, and woman, performing very heroic deeds. And their stories are one to read. So thank you very much to all of the Foss family for journeying here and joining us. This is a good evening. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, both of you. Um, I'm not going to try to compete with that, um, except to, but I will. That, that, uh, I, I think this was a long road. Um, Seaman Foss passed away some years ago, and we have had memorials um, in the local cemetery on this that um, you never get everybody to get there from a political sense, but they do come to that, and that's a, that's a great unifying message that, that comes from that. So I'm grateful, Jim, that you took the, on this uh, responsibility and that we're bringing it finally to fruition. Um, I think tonight the recommendation will be to accept the appropriateness of the, um, of the recommendation. Uh, there are two other things I just would like the public to understand. Uh, because we are naming a building, uh, there is a public hearing that is, would be required. After, and then also we will need a joint recommendation from the Historical Commission and ourselves to the annual town meeting to confirm this next, uh, next April. Th that is correct. Okay. So, and, uh, but that would happen at the town meeting when the warrant is. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And we'll put. And the warrant will close by January 20th, so we'll know where everybody. This is where it comes. Stand up and be counted. This so, is the first step. This is just step one. So, um, I would entertain a motion to accept the uh, recommendation of the FOSS committee for its appropriateness. Second. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I, too, would like to thank the FOSS family. I, I understand some of you had to have your passport stamped to come up here from <laughs> Cape Cod. So uh, I appreciate that, uh, that, that you came all this way. And I'm sure he's looking down on all of you with a great deal of pride that this, uh, we have finally gotten to this mem memorial. So thank you, Jim, and thank the committee on our behalf. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the action and the swift action you've taken. I, I wanted to qualify, Paul, the words that I mentioned earlier with respect to the, uh, the statistics that we currently have, I believe, 78 living members of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, the president is awarding seven or eight of these every couple of years. The last one was awarded to a chaplain that served in the 1st Cavalry Division in the uh, Korean War. Mm -hmm. So that's how far back it goes. It's a very rare uh, award that the president gives for valor. It's, you, you earn the award. It's not, it's not an award, really, so I'm misspeaking there. It, it's a, it's a, uh, a distinguished recognition of valor in combat. Uh, but there are places all over the United States named after Medal of Honor winners. O'Hare Airport is a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank is there you. anything more that you wish us to? Uh, no, um, I think your intent is to go to the Historic Commission and- Their meeting is September 16th, that is correct. So you and I should talk um, and further about how we make this come to life. That's the- I'll be happy to do that. Uh, and, and we will oh, yes, go before them on the 16th. Terrific. 
and then I would ask the board to to consider whether or not uh, you wish the uh, Veterans Council or the selectmen to sponsor the Warren article that we'll undertake uh, as as time goes on. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you for coming thank to the. Uh, thank you all for thank coming. You. Go Navy. Uh. Go Army. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Did I hear Go Navy here? Uh, he's a seaman. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Football season hasn't Coming. even started yet. <laughs> jump, jump, jump. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, Randy, we're 50 minutes behind, but I know you have. Uh, um, we have uh, made a commitment to certainly the residents on North Street, but to the town at large, to address the whole issue of the sewer policy. And uh, the first and most important issue to resolve is the issue on North Street. And uh, um, this is an ongoing, and I, I think I'll echo uh, our friends in the newspapers who have encouraged us to get this done and get it done right. While it is not, and I'll say again, it is not a responsibility of the Board of the Selectmen to do this, we feel that it's important enough that we've got to escalate it to our level to make sure that it's properly addressed. And helping us lead the charges, uh, I guess I better, I was going to call him Colonel. Uh, Sylvester, but I better call him Commander. I guess that's a more appropriate term. So, Randy, if you could give us an update from where we were and what you've learned so far. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm here to update you on the North Street odor issue. And um, uh, since the last meeting, um, this is kind of a short update, but since the last meeting, we put all um, all events have been replaced on on the residents. Um, with an upgraded uh, new style vent, which is more effective. Um, two, we're still applying the chemical dioxide and uh, at the Mill Street uh, well, and the odor loggers, which is which are put in the manholes in that area, measure zero parts per million of hydrogen sulfide. <coughs> and up to date since the last meeting, and I got to clarify some is that we, we have no formal complaints with, for odors. Um, I do have to mention that at the last meeting I mentioned that we didn't have any complaints. Um, our <coughs> customer software system um, logged in an address with an old owner. So at that time I didn't know it, but there was a complaint of odor prior to that. I just wanted to clarify that. And that's about it. I'll add that the uh, Board of Health and um, oh. Steve Dempsey from the sewer uh, uh, department um, are inspecting the restaurants in the area on a weekly basis until such time as um, they feel comfortable that um, the problems have been solved. And uh, for the <coughs> benefit of the folks at home, that de deals with a technical subject called fog, oh, okay. which fog. I know Irma's become an expert on. I'm learning uh, so much. much. Um, <laughs> uh, th there is an issue that um, the grease and the odor didn't just get there, and that somehow it arrived, and what we want to redouble our efforts is to make sure that we're in compliance with the, uh, with the uh, health and safety procedures for uh, containing any odors that may result from um, insertions into the drain. So um, this is ongoing. Uh, is it on ongoing ins inspections are happening? Um, Board of Health, Steve Stempsey, they're out there doing inspections um, two or three a week in the restaurants. Okay. Restaurants. So I have uh, committed Randy to his Thursday nights once a month. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so September 19th, we're going to do this again to make sure that the report is, stays um, tried and true and that we have fixed or appear to have fixed the problem with the degree of satisfaction. So are there any questions from the public? Yes, sir. Come on. Gerard Travers, 81 North Street. I want to thank the board uh, again tonight for assembling and addressing the issue, but I think we've all been thrown under the bus when it comes to the Sewer Commission. They voted on March 5 in a motion by Commissioner Demko to petition the board to open the street. And then on July 2nd, they voted to wait for the moratorium. So I think there's an issue with the, the Sewer Commission. They're vacillating back and forth. And that might be the problem we go back to 05.
because everyone looks differently than I, I don't know. I just it's 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 mind-boggling that this has happened to us, and and it shouldn't be before you people tonight. They requested it, and now on January or July second, they say, well, let's wait for the moratorium, and that's what the town wants. Uh, we just received the letter from the DEP or something, and they suggest the moratorium also. Um, but I think the sewer commission has an issue here that they have to look at it. If they want the road to be open to repair the problem, it should be done, and that's why it would be for you. And then their meeting says, no, we'll wait. That's not the problem. So I think there's an issue over there. Um, they're not here tonight. I know the representative of the highways here. The DPW. He is the right. supervisor of the. Okay, but we do have a commission. There's three of them. And they voted to dig the road up, and, and here we are tonight. So I think the issue is moved now at this point. Um, the DEP, I think, at whatever I have to forget the initial. Wait, they want the moratorium. The sewer commission has changed their mind in a couple of months, and they said, "Well, let's wait." So hopefully, we can wait and then do something. It, the, the, there's the problem under that ground, and the report indicates that, and it should be repaired sometime, right? Even though we've dug up Beale Street because back in 10 or 2010, something was done, mm -hmm. you know, but that road was dug up also. So, again, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple questions, and I want to thank Randy and Steve Dempsey and also Susan Rowe. I think Steve and Susan Rowe are making a terrific team across two departments. Um, I attended the Sewer Commission meeting, and just as a follow-up, Randy, um, what's the status of North Street Pizza, the Thai restaurant, and my favorite, Nona's? Um, Nona's uh, has, uh, uh, they put their system in, um, they brought the drawings, whatnot, to Steve Dempsey, whatnot, and they've installed it. Uh, the North Street Pizza. They were written a letter by the Board of Health. They have to bring. They have to submit to the uh, Board of Health a uh, a grease trap uh, system that will work. Uh, we have Steve Dempsey and Susan Rowe has gone down. Have gone down and inspected the facility. They think one can go in there. Um, but it's up to the uh, the um, businesses to come in and apply to the Board of Health. <coughs> and if they don't, and that process is taking place, because I think I just looked quickly in the package and there's a letter that went out. There's a letter that went out. And there's going to be a time frame, and if they don't do it? Uh, they could have their license to operate removed. We will do something. So we are back has here the authority to, to Jerry's point. The Board of Health has the authority to restrict their ability to conduct business okay. if so, they conduct business in a manner that would harm the sewer system. Yeah. So the two <laughs> restaurants that don't have the appropriate fog controls. Mung Thai, <clears throat> they have the, the appropriate sized grease trap. Unfortunately, Hingham Pizza is tied into that, which re by regulation they're not supposed to be. And it's... Uh, not appropriately sized okay. for the two re restaurants. So we want <coughs> the, the, the sewer side of things, we want a separate grease trap according to the regulations. And I'm assuming the Board of Health would back that up. And I spoke with Susan Rowe of the Board of Health and that is their recommendation too Excellent. and they're working forward towards that. Yeah, one, I, I, okay, one, then I'll ask my one last question. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll um, finish. Our rules and regulations, are they equal to, better than, or different from the states? Are we like at a higher level, which Hingham tends to be? Um, they're, they're right along with the states. Okay, they're, they're just about equal. Okay. But we're now on a path that if somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, we will take action. Correct. We are the authority, the Board of Health. Excellent. The authority. Yep. Good Thank questions. you. Good question. <clears throat> yeah, I understand there's a meeting on September. You'll get a chance, I promise. <laughs> September 12th, there's yes. a, another meeting of the Sewer Commission on that Yes, there's, there's going to be a, yeah. Okay. So that's why you and I agreed that September 19th, we'll see what happens just to make sure that it progresses along the lines yes. that we have and that the steps we've taken continue to get the satisfactory results. Yes. Okay. 
<clears throat> yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Cynthia Moore, 87 North Street. Um, I just want to voice a couple of concerns um, from our perspective as residents that are affected by this. Um, we have a board of selectmen here that we all know now because we've dealt with you. We have a director of um, public works that we know who, you know, you've all promised us that you're going to continue, you know, clean the sewers twice a year and you're going to continue to pay for chemicals that are supposedly going to counteract the odor. What happens when you're gone? and you're gone, what kind of guarantee do we have that this type of program, as Jerry stated, we know there's a problem in the ground. And right now, this is, this is masking it. it it's, it's taking care of it temporarily, but it's not a permanent solution. So as residents that intend to live here for years, I, I grew up here, I'm, I'm a, a, a hangamite. Um, what is our guarantee that when you're gone and you're gone, that this program is gonna continue without fixing the root problem? Um, like any program, um, uh, the personnel change, but the policies stay in place. So what we do here, certainly what I do, is ask all my departments to write procedures and policies that will outlive the department staff. And uh, that's what we've done here. And Randy's done a great job of making sure that the sewer supervisor understands what his roles and responsibilities are. Um, as the overseer of the sewer day-to-day -day operations now through a contract with the sewer department, which we would hope would be renewed um, so that the Board of Selectmen can stay involved, uh, we would continue to make sure those policies stay in force and are followed through. And it's part of the evaluation process I do of Randy every year, and Randy subsequently does of his staff, I expect people to adhere to the policies that we've drafted. And that's the best guarantee we can give you. And anyway, the reason that I asked that question is that there was a chemical um, program in place at one time, and it somehow it slipped through the cracks and totally stopped. Correct. And, that and was, I think that was a change in personnel. Yeah. Well, it was also an independent board that had, you know, complete oversight of that area and no other oversight. So now we have checks and balances. We have the DBW, which reports to the Board of Selectmen and to the Sewer Commission. So we have another board that's, that's <coughs> keeping an eye on this. I think you have a better chance of making sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. Cynthia, also, Randy's education is in line with this, so he really does understand the problems. I'm, I, I understand that. I'm saying when Randy's not here any longer. You going somewhere? Oh, yeah. Whenever. Okay. You know, I don't think Cynthia, so. let, me, uh, let me just give Paul a chance to comment, if I may. I can appreciate your frustration, as well as my uh, good friends seated there, Diane and Jerry. Um, I've tried to approach this deliberately because I've kind of just gotten into this by virtue of coming in fresh. And But I do know that on the planning board, when we have approved a design, we subsequently will get an as-built plan that doesn't totally reflect what was approved of the design. And that's kind of what I'm seeing here. So my real question is, is this departure from the design plan so flawed that it needs to be pulled out in its entirety and replaced. And before I sign on to that conclusion, I want to try other less expensive things. I mean, you've heard this already from a number of different sources. I've reached out to the chairman of the Board of Health um, and I've communicated with him. Um, he's committed to making this happen. And as uh, it seems apparent by the uh, documentation we've gotten with respect to the scheduling of the grease traps, and the, you know, the installation of these devices in all of the um, uh, restaurants and food suppliers there. I am I'm hopeful that that will reduce or eliminate this inflow of grease which causes the odor in the neighborhood from occurring. Um, you know, we've got the highway, we've got the sewer department, we've got the Board of Health, and the selectmen are bird dogging it. So I'm, I'm hoping between all four of these groups um, we can eliminate this problem so that this is a distant memory. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to be here forever. I may be here just a very short time. Um, but there's going to be somebody who takes my place that sees the file, sees what we've done, knows what we have to do. Um, and if what we're doing now doesn't work, then we go to the next step. But I, I mean, I just, I, I'm, I'm uneasy about ripping up a street 
and doing a fix that maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. If I could just echo something with that. First of all, the street ripping up is not off the tape. But we would be remiss, given that that's 30 percent, that one street opening could be 30 percent of our street budget. Um, I want to be sure we do it when all else has failed. So my commitment as that I've been making right along is we'll keep <coughs> bird dogging this until such time as you come to me and say, thank you, it's fixed. Or you say, it's not fixed. The, um, I'm not so sure that Jerry's comment earlier that the, that the fixing and pulling of the trap will fix the problem. The grease gets there some other way. And what we believe, and I thank Paul for bird dogging this one particularly, is that somebody's putting it there. And the way we have inspections and procedures to make sure, that's the way to make sure that people are following those so that it's not there. And, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but, or Ted, I understand that they are inspecting the restaurants on a, a much more frequent basis than they did in the past. Absolutely. Right now they're doing it weekly. Will they continue weekly? Um, for some time. Uh, but at some time, you know, we don't have the resources um, to do it weekly forever. But you know, if you do we weekly for several months and you see compliance, then you shift back to monthly and, and so on, and making sure that the compliance is appropriate. So are they unannounced? Uh, some are, some are. There. So and we, we we understand that the grease is an issue, but it's compounded is. by the dip in, with it's collecting it in the in the pipe. That's. Um, that that may be are you an engineer I read the engineers report yeah I did too okay so I'm not an engineer and I'm certainly not a sewer engineer so I rely on those people to tell me what is causing that problem um, so I think as Paul very correctly said what we should do is pursue it and make sure that that option is gone and that the odor is minimized we've installed technical equipment to help us with that card because the, the, the other thing that you should be proud of what you've done is this has spurred an entire review of the sewer yeah. policy, and uh, that's a good thing. This is a problem not just with North Street, but what do you say? You've read it as much as I have. 40 years, 30 years, um, there are certain things that we thought were done that weren't that should be, and that's what we're trying to address. So um, that's the. Um, that's the, that's the issue we're trying to, to bring the closure. So thank you for being persistent and patient with us, but this ain't over till it's over, and it's, it's not over. Just one last question for me. Sure. sure. The $150,000 that was allocated to this problem, is that is that going to be kept in a reserve for the day that it may need to be, the street may need to be open? Well, you know, as I told the board last week, or uh, sorry, uh, several weeks ago at their meeting, uh, the information I had received from the sewer department um, indicated that it was turned over to the general fund um, in ERA and that um, uh, it should belong to the sewer fund. Um, but subsequently, I received communication from the former chair, uh, John Brandt of the Sewer Commission, who indicated it was not turned over to the general fund in ERA, it was turned over accurately. I have to get a little further into that explanation, but as Mr. Brandt um, indicated to me, the Sewer Commission um, received $150,000 from the MBTA. 100000 of it was for mitigation for water that was pumped, groundwater that was pumped during the construction of the, um, of the, uh, of the tunnel in Hingham Center, uh, Hingham, downtown Hingham, rather. And that water was pumped out of, the, out of the tunnel and into the sewer system. And subsequently, all the ratepayers paid increased fees from the MWRA because we pay per gallon for that. And they used that hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and six, I believe, or seven, to offset those rates. Subsequently, they got another fifty thousand. It's part of the hundred fifty, and um, they have a recommendation from CDM at the time not to fix the SAG because they felt that that was not the solution. Um, and they voted to use the other 50000 to also offset the rate. So in fact, the money was turned over to the general fund, and based upon the newest information I have, which is literally a week old, um, and I have not verified this uh, any further than the conversation I've had with the former chairman, um, they felt that all of the money was appropriately turned over to the general fund because they used it to lower the rates in those years. So if, in fact, those statements are correct, um, 
then there is no $150,000, and the sewer department would have to use other funds, of which they have, by the way, to fix uh, their sewer lines. Um, part of this is what you had said earlier. How do we stop this from happening in the future? The file is so incomplete. And we're going back, Randy and myself, Steve Dempsey, Susan Rowe, we're going back and trying to reconstruct data that just wasn't there for whatever reason. And I don't want to cast blame, I just, it's not there. And we're trying to piecemeal this together to figure out what transpired and put a good record forward so that the file is very clear about um, recommendations, solutions, and things like where the money is. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this will be, uh no, no Patriots games on the we'll, 19th. We'll so, see you yeah. again, is that? <laughs> he's, he's coming back. Um, and I think, Ted, when you could give us whatever, an update as what you have on the data, as I know you will, so, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, Randy. Ms. Mr. Harris, <coughs> Ms. Byrne, I'd like to uh, welcome back. <laughs> Uh, the next item on the agenda deals with a, as I mentioned at the beginning, a discussion on our relationship with Plymouth County. I didn't hear you your voice. And um, people say that you lost. Get this chair. I, I've. Uh, Just need to did they I'm lower sorry, you? Sorry, Mr. Town Administrator, I cannot sit in this chair. <laughs> Here, take it. Who's got Laura's do you chair? Want to borrow, <laughs> Laura, do you want to borrow your chair back? Uh, This is, a, as, just to refresh the public, uh, we've had two meetings with representatives from Plymouth County where they have put forth the idea as to why we should stay in Plymouth County. Um, and uh, Laura Byrne and Carl Harris have been doing the examination on our behalf uh, and I, we asked them to come in and give us a status report on what they have uncovered. So I, I think Laura, former chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, she never really retires, you know that. That never happens. So, Laura, if you will. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, Laura Burns, 96 Hersey Street, and I'm <clears throat> my uh, background with the Plymouth County issue dates back to when I was chair of the board and I attended the meetings of the Plymouth County Advisory Board, which is the board with budgetary responsibility for Plymouth County, consisting of representatives of each town from the executive, be it uh, selectman or mayor. And I would like to recognize before I go any further, the current chair of the Plymouth County Advisory Board, Selectman Ellen Allen from Norwell, who's with us this evening. If we have any questions, Ellen, there nice she is. It. And uh, thank you for taking the time to attend. Um, <clears throat> and Carl Harris is uh, Hingham and Hall's representative to the Plymouth County Charter Commission. Just for a little bit of background for those who may not remember, uh, I'm not going to get the dates right, but some years ago Plymouth County voted uh, to put on the ballot a question whether there should be a charter commission to write a charter for the county because the county doesn't have one. And that, uh, bar that uh, ballot question passed and representatives were uh, elected, more or less. And um, Carl was elected from Hingham and Hull representing us. So he has, most of the things I'm gonna tell you, Carl was the one who dug up that information because he has been tireless in, in, um, in uh, working on that. So where am I pointing this? Oop. Okay, let's begin at the beginning. Why should we ask if Plymouth County still serves Hingham's best interests? Well, the reason we ask is that Hingham receives very few benefits from membership in Plymouth County. Um, and we pay a significant price for those benefits. This year our assessment is $110,000. Think what you could do with that money, members of the board. Um, so we're going to ask, are the benefits worth the price? Let's take a look at what the benefits are. Um, when you had your last meeting on this. We had um, Plymouth County Treasurer uh, Tom O'Brien who came in to answer the question, what does the county do for you? And the first thing he said was, the county brings you the registry. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, that's the most obvious. Conveniently located courthouse. Having uh, Hingham Court uh, right nearby is, is a great time saver and money saver for our police department and for all of our citizens who need to use it. Um, the uh, Administration of 4-H clubs in Plymouth County, including a very active uh, club at uh, Weir River Farm, whom you, you heard from the 4-H club representative last time. 
um, access to a fire spotter airplane and uh, access to joint purchasing programs. We believe that those are currently the only things that Plymouth County offers to the town of Hingham that we take advantage of. So um, let's take a look at each one of them. The Registry of Deeds uh, is a great benefit and it's the prime service that we get. Uh, we need the registry. Our registry, in my humble opinion, is well run, efficient. It's a credit to its elected registrar and its staff. Um, they have my full support and they often have to make do with less money than they should have, but it's one of the most uh, technologically advanced registries. And also we have the satellite locations, uh, the, satel the northern satellite location that's very close to Hingham, which is a great advantage uh, when homeowners, I myself have been there to register a deed. And uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have that. But the registry doesn't need the county. So treasury, the treasurer said uh, the, the county brings you the registry. It's a little bit more like the registry at this point is bringing us the county because um, without the registry, there wouldn't be much left of the county. And as it happens, the registry brings in enough money, revenue, to fund itself. And uh, the reason that the county has trouble sometimes funding the registry is that the state takes most of the money. And uh, to the credit of the current commissioners and the Charter Commission, they have set out to try to rectify that. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that underneath, if you were to make a new arrangement, uh, the registry bring, brings in enough cash to support itself. It doesn't need a county. Uh, most registries in the state are run by the state because if you take a look at the map in the area that represents 70% of the population of Massachusetts, as you saw when Carl made his presentation, there are no counties. They were dissolved uh, some decades ago when most of the counties in that area were bankrupt and their, their functions were taken over by the state. So um, that raises sort of an interesting question because um, we, uh, we have a registry, but we have a little expensive uh, superstructure attached to it as well called the county. And we have to pay an <coughs> assessment in order to have access to our registry. Our tax dollars support the registries elsewhere in the state, but we also have to pay extra for our own registry, and that's a bit of an inequity. It's inequitable taxation. So uh, that's kind of a concern for us. It doesn't seem fair that we should have a different financial arrangement with our registry than people elsewhere in the state. But nothing about the services that we receive from our efficient, well-run registry would need to change if the county dissolved. Um, so uh, let's talk about the courthouse. Very convenient location. It's of great benefit. But we have the kind of the same situation with the courts. Plymouth County rents the courthouses to the state. And where the state has to rent from the private sector in other areas, they pay as much as twice the rent that they pay Plymouth County. And uh, anybody who's been in those courthouses know that they're in deplorable condition. It's not the fault of the county. It's the fault of the state who declines to pay an adequate rent and doesn't pay it on time to the county. Doesn't seem like the best arrangement for having, uh, for having uh, you know, useful courthouses in our area. Um, it, some of some of the uh, some of the costs of um, of running the state fall on the county. For example, we, the, by which I mean Plymouth County, and therefore us, when we pay our assessment, um, we pay, we actually pay switchboard operators in the Hingham and the Brockton courts. And when I was on the advisory board, I asked why that was, and they said, well, it's because the courts wanted us to pay for it. But the residents of the 70% of the, count, uh, the state that doesn't have counties don't pay for services that should be being delivered by the judicial court system. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're being taken for a ride. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to put it that way. And, and I think everybody who's been involved with a county uh, will agree with that. Now, when uh, tre the treasurer came here, he uh, and, and we have heard this quite a bit as Carl and I have had this discussion. They're going to take Hingham Court away from you. If you dissolve Plymouth County, where are you going to go to court? And it's a threat. We've heard this threat a number of times. But the reality is that the state will decide, this judicial court decision, uh, system will make the decision about where the court courthouses are going to go, where they're going to stay, where they're going to go. It's true, our courthouses are cheaper. That's because 
they're taking us for a ride and our courthouses are in bad condition. Um, it seems like a situation that we should fix. It may happen that if we have a new arrangement and enough money is provided, say for example from the state, a reasonable amount to maintain those courthouses, the state may decide that the Hingham County Courthouse is not feasible for them to maintain. That is possible, but it's not going to happen because uh, people from the county take it away from us. It's going to happen based on decisions made at the court level, and we have no way of knowing what those decisions would be, and neither do the people who uh, represent Plymouth County have any way of knowing what that decision would be. So uh, 4-H club administration is also of great benefit, but most 4-H programs are administered statewide. I assure you there are 4-H programs in Western Massachusetts. There's a statewide program that administers those. And in fact, uh, I think um, it's Norfolk and Bristol? Norfolk and Bristol. Norfolk and Bristol, south of us, actually represent a region in the statewide program. They don't manage their 4-H club themselves. They are part of the statewide program. And um, so uh, we could do that too. That would be very easy. Um, when asked why we should not do that, the, the lovely lady from the 4-H club who does such wonderful work who was here last time mentioned that um, uh, the uh, fees for children to be in the 4-H club here are $25, whereas in the statewide program they are $50. And I would just submit to you members of the board that it would be much cheaper for the town to step up and pay the other half of the kids to go to the 4-H club than to spend two teachers or two fire fighters worth of salaries to maintain the county. We don't need the county to provide 4-H services to our kids. Um, so uh, we could do that ourselves. She also, also mentioned that I think her office is in Wareham and the state's office is in Waltham, do I have that right? Yes. And she didn't care to have her central office changed, but I'm not sure that's a reason for us to have a county, um, much as I respect her concerns. Uh, so the fire spotter airplane, of great benefit or not? We don't know. Carl has been spent untold hours trying to find documentation of how much attention we get from this airplane. Where does it go? What are the flight records? He can't seem to get hold of them. I invite you to look at the map of Plymouth County and look at where Hingham is relative to the rest of the county. How often do you think that fire spotter airplane comes up to Hingham? Uh, I'm just guessing I would be happy to re retract my inference if they could show us that the firefighter airplane ever comes up here. Now understandably Chief Duff does not want to lose access to any piece of firefighting equipment that he could have. I totally understand that completely. So let's consider once again the fire spotter airplane service costs the whole county $15,000 a year. If we went in with two towns next to us we could each pay $5,000 get the same service and probably have the plane visit a lot more often than it probably does right now although I'm willing to I'm willing to hear that they do come up here. I don't know that they do. And then the fi final benefit on the list is the joint purchasing programs. We have not found that in our town to be of much use. We have found the ones, you can ask Betty for more information about this, but we found the ones offered by the MAPC and some of the other consortia to be much more beneficial to us. Um, there are other ways to get access to both purchasing programs, but it certainly is not something that we should have to pay an assessment to have access to. We don't have to pay uh, assessments to these other consortia, so that doesn't make too much sense. So those are the five benefits. Registry of deeds, definitely a benefit, but it can stand on its own. If the county dissolved, we would still have a registry, just like they do out in Western Mass. Conveniently located court courthouse is a question. We don't know what might happen if the county dissolved. 4-H uh, club administration, fire spotter airplane, access to joint purchasing programs, all things that can be services that can be supplied in other ways and for which we don't need a county superstructure with a full-time county manager, full-time. And I would just mention that the budget of the county this year is about $9 million, so they have somebody the equivalent of Ted managing their budget full-time, plus a full-time treasurer and staff. And ladies and gentlemen, you man manage a budget of $90 million, 10 times the size. So I, I'm just asking why are we spending these resources, these taxpayer funds, on this superstructure? So the, the um, chairman asked me to say what are, would be the benefits of withdrawing from the county and of course, or seeing the county dissolved, and of course the first thing would be to stop the bleeding and have uh, future savings. Um, 
uh, money that we spend now for which we get little in return. And we would have an end to those inequitable double standards about how registries are paid for and how courthouses are paid for, which is not the same as in other places. Um, we are ad assessed additionally for those, uh, for those services that come to the state taxpayers out of state funds in the rest of the state. Um, but finally, there's also the question of a removal of a layer of government which few, of which few taxpayers are aware, uh, which is largely flies under the radar and has the potential to continue to spend taxpayer funds without adequate oversight, either from the towns being assessed or the taxpayers who ultimately pay. And why would I say, why would I say it's not accountable? Well, I would invite you to ask anybody on the street or even in the town halls of Plymouth County what Plymouth County does, and we have found, Carl and I, and talking to people on the street or in town halls here or elsewhere in Plymouth County, they will name services which no longer are or never were functions of Plymouth County. Sheriff's Office, the jail have all gone, have gone to the state. Plymouth County Mosquito Control is a state program, never had anything to do with the county. Um, count, dissolution of the county would have no effect on it. Mayflower Health Group used to be run by the county, but is now an independent association run by the towns directly who belong to it, not all of whom are in Plymouth County and not all Plymouth County towns are in it. Uh, and the Plymouth County Pension System, which also stands on its own, all independent or state entities. Citizens and even town governments have no awareness of or connection to the actual county the way they do to town government. And uh, so one of the reasons this is so is because of the requirement that town's representatives to the county advisory board, which is the entity with uh, budgetary oversight, must be selectmen. Uh, you, the Board of Selectmen, our Board of Selectmen, cannot appoint someone to be our representative, and that means in order to be involved in the county, one of you three has to give up another evening when the uh, County Advisory Board meets in order to be involved in it. And I would like to bow to Selectman Allen for putting in all the effort that she does. I admire anybody who's willing to, who's willing to go to that length to, to get involved in, in Plymouth County. Um, but in terms of awareness, the election of the Plymouth County Charter Commission on which Carl sits is a really good example. Uh, when they, the representatives from the county were here last time, they talked about your democratically elected Charter Commission. And here, that's true. Carl was elected in an, in a, an election where he had opposition and he got votes. Luckily, and his, uh, luckily, uh, <coughs> luckily I'm from Hingeman. My opponent was from Hull. So. Yeah, so that's probably how it broke down. Uh, very, I, I, I've heard that the gentleman from Hull was a very, very excellent candidate as well. So we had two excellent candidates, either of whom would have been fine, except that Carl would have been a tiny bit better. So that's good he was elected. But um, there, are, there are 19 positions on the Charter Commission. Four of them are, the, are appointed by themselves, the Charter Commissioners. Um, and then, um, out of 15 elections, only four were contested at all. So in other words, in eight out of 15 elections, more than half, there was no one at all on the ballot. And some of those representatives were elected by write-in votes, some of them by less than five votes. So this will tell you what the level of awareness across the county is, or interest, or whatever, what the connection is that the citizens have with Plymouth County. And the county is getting some attention right now but uh, my main concern, I, I, will, I would like to take a moment just to say about the current elected officials of Plymouth County, I admire them all, I think they're all great. Compared to the, the commissioners that we had previously who were the opposite of great and who uh, by and large got the county into some very bad situations where they were selling assets to balance the budget, et cetera, et cetera. The current commissioners, one of whom was elected two years ago and two of whom were elected last year, have uh, done a tremendous amount of good work. And if you think there should be a county, they're doing all the right things. They are working really hard to try to turn Plymouth County into something. Uh, but I, it is my personal opinion that we're getting some attention right now, but it's very likely that after a while the um, county is likely to drift back into the background and continue to absorb taxpayers' dollars to very little purpose. Um, and so where we stand right now is the Charter Commission, the Charter that the Charter Commission wrote is waiting for the legislature to approve it to go on the ballot. It has a number of changes. Um, it it's, it uh, talks about delivering um, regional services, which we're all in favor of. But um, uh, of course, the county could be doing that right now and could have done it 
all along. So I'm not sure what the change is that would make that happen. Um, it calls for five commissioners instead of three. So now they need five commissioners to manage a $9 million budget instead of three. Uh, and there are a number of things in it that, uh, that alarm me. So um, anyway, so I was also asked by the chairman to say, uh, we are, I just covered that. What would be the cost of county dissolution? Loss of hand courthouse, unknowable at this point. No matter what the people from the county tell you, we don't know what would happen. So that's a real, a real question mark. Um, pay off pension and OPEB liabilities. And this is where the true cost for Hingham comes. Um, there is a, we have pension liabilities for previous county employees who are in the pension system now or will be. And there was an off the cost estimate made a couple of years ago by the then chairman of the advisory board that Hingham's liability for that was about $2 million. Um, and uh, then, of course, there is the OPEB liabilities, which we don't know what they are because the county had never, never done the study, never asked the question. And to the credit of the current commissioners, they have uh, called for the study, they paid for it, it should be out soon, and we will know what those liabilities are. That's a very good thing that the current county commissioners have done to help the towns out in knowing what our liabilities are. Um, but uh, so how would, how would that be paid? Well, when the, when the other counties dissolve, the 70% of counties, uh, what, when the state took their assets, and if the assets didn't cover the liabilities, they simply continued to bill the assessment to, this, to the towns until it was paid off. And the difference between that and what's happening now is we are paying our liabilities, we're paying our assessment, and we're creating new liabilities as we pay it because we're paying employees who are generating pension and OPEB liabilities. So I personally, myself, would rather see, um, would rather see uh, us use our assessment to pay off our liabilities, honestly, because that's the Hingham way. We don't, um, we don't put, put our liabilities in the closet and try to forget about it. And I would rather uh, see us do that. So um, just um, uh, a couple of comments before we, we get to our su suggested actions. Last time, uh, Selectman Allen was here and she asked us not to, or two, two visits ago, I forget, asked us not to take any action counter to Plymouth County because it would hurt the other towns. And I asked her uh, why, because of course I was concerned about that. And she is concerned, and she can, if I say this wrong, you can come in and, and clear it up, but she's concerned about the liabilities, the OPEB and the pension liabilities. It's easy enough for Hingham to say, well, you know, $2 million and we can deal with that. Other towns, it may not be so easy. So, so that, is, that is a real issue. However, I don't see that, honestly, that continuing to pay the assessment like they are now until they're paid out really harms the towns any more than they are currently being harmed, at least, and at least it creates a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the League of Women Voters is studying this issue here in Hingham, and they hope to have a, a report out in the spring. Plymouth uh, League, of, uh, League of Women Voters has already voted to support the dissolution of the county. And I will mention dissolution of the county because when we first began this discussion, we were talking about Hingham seceding from the county, which was a bit of a quixotic uh, vision of mine. but. Um, uh, our esteemed state representative, Mr. Garrett Bradley, the uh, assistant majority whip, has informed me that since the legislature would be required to do that for us, that that is not going to happen. And Representative Bradley is in a position to say that it is not going to happen. If it, so I'm inclined to take that at face value and uh, urge that we consider the other option, which is to dissolve Plymouth County, because there's a, there's a, um, uh, there's a blueprint for that. It's been done successfully. Um, and so that's why I'm talking about dissolution. So uh, this is, uh, these are the three suggested actions that we might bring to you. You have a resolution that we have been carrying around various places. Um, and what I would suggest is uh, that you consider what, what you've heard, think about what your points of view are, and maybe adopt adapt that resolution to represent whatever your point of view is. It's just a draft. Change anything about it that doesn't make sense to you, but kind of lays out reasons why you might consider dissolving the county and whatever action you think is called for at the end, you could do that. Um, the other thing we could do is a thing, in the meantime, I mentioned the problem of, of lack of attention to Plymouth County because selectmen have to be the ones to pay attention to it. 
Um, and one uh, part of the county charter that is currently in the legislature that I think is excellent is that it allows uh, boards, of rep boards of selectmen to appoint representatives to represent them to the Plymouth County Advisory Board. And th if you did that, then you could find one of our core of 400 dedicated recidivist volunteers to go to the, to, to really dig into this for you and really stay on top of it. And I think that would be good for every town. We might raise the profile of the county a little bit if every town didn't have to free up a selectman every time there was a meeting of the advisory board. Um, so I would suggest that, that you ask our state house delegation to file legislation uh, to allow uh, boards of selectmen to appoint the representatives other than themselves. And I guess that would go for mayor's offices too. I don't know if the mayor has to come or not. The mayor of Brockton has never been there when, when I've been there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you sent a letter to the county after our last meeting asking for a long, wide variety of information and my understanding is there's been no response. Is that right? Correct. Um, uh, Assistant Town Administrator Betty Foley spoke with um, Brian McDonald. Okay. Why don't you relay the answer? And he informed me that <clears throat> the audits that they spoke of when they were here were taking a little longer than anticipated. They hope to conclude the audits through 2009 uh, within the next month, and then doing the more recent ones should take another month or six weeks after that. Uh, okay. There was a lot more information requested in, in that letter than just the audits. He, and I would he informed me that the basis of most of the responses would be the results of the audit. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, um, I would urge you to pr pursue that be because you wrote a letter and you should get an answer from that full-time administrator. So those are our three um, possible suggestions. Another idea has come up to uh, possibly avoid, appoint one of our famous study groups a small group of people to continue looking for answers to questions like what is the real cost of dissolving the county um, and bring solid numbers before you for you to consider. Um, that's also a possibility. So, and I don't know if you have anything to add, Carl, if you'd like to. Uh, I think you covered everything. I just want to thank the uh, citizens of Hingham for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, learn what I've learned about county government. And I have spent the last three years a great deal of time and telephone calls throughout the county, I mean throughout the state of Massachusetts, and uh, talked to a lot of people. And I've learned a lot, and I appreciate it. And uh, I've tried to represent Hingham and Hull. I, I've been in Hingham since 1944. I love the town, and I want to do what's right for the town. And I think what we have done is identify a problem. And it's a problem that has to be faced. And we can kick the can down the road, but it's just going to get a bigger problem. And so I want to, again, thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to you know, learn about county government. Okay. <clears throat> thank you both. That was uh, informative. Ted, could I have the lights, please? Um, So Betty, if I heard you correctly, we, we should expect a letter response in October? That's what we were told, a couple months. Um, okay, so that gives us a little bit of time to, to uh, think about this. And I think, Laura, your suggestion about a group to, uh, this would be, I'll ask my colleagues for this as well, but to study this in more detail, because um, what are the expenses and, and what are there any ancillary uh, expenses. Um, while the Mayflower Group is not part of this discussion, that's an independent body, um, I'd like to understand the relationship that that would take because in that case Tom O'Brien serves in wearing two hats and I'd like to know what the implications for that might be. I think that's something this study group could do. And I think your idea on the savings versus you know, getting some numbers to the to the table that would help us understand what goes down and what goes up and what's the net of that transaction. I think you've outlined that fairly fairly well. And I think, if from my own standpoint, uh, allowing the BOS to appoint a permanent representative, because as we all know, I think you become a selectman and it takes you about a year and a half to get up to speed. Um, not to scare you, Paul. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Notice I'm not saying anything. <laughs> no, 
know, that quizzical look will become very knowledgeable <laughs> shortly. But it does take time, and it and this is um, this is something that deserves a commitment if it should continue. And of of course, the, the major point is, and, and I'd like to share a story, uh, so that some people think I'm, my mind is made up. Uh, in the state of New York, where I grew up, they moved to county government about 20 years ago, and uh, the chairman of the county commission in Ulster County, which is the city of Kingston, was my cousin, and his brother was the chairman of the county commission in Dutchess County across the river in Poughkeepsie. And what happened was, as they took on more and more services, the counties supplanted the towns. And now the towns have very low structures, and it's because the structure of the government was such that, and the way the geography is laid out, counties made sense, as opposed to what goes on in Pennsylvania, where um, it's more in the municipal framework because towns, and I think you can attest to this, Laura, from your background, it's done a little bit differently. So there are benefits on both on both sides. But I think it does need, uh, I, I am, con my concern, which you didn't, um, specifically mentioned, but I'll ask Carl this question if I may. Carl, there was a proposed list of potential services that was put forth that the county could provide us. Is that, is that, am I saying that right? Yeah, it's uh, in the charter and there's, uh, I think, my page, I got to open right to it. <laughs> Job reforms and functions, but it, it, what, there's nothing specifically uh, researched to say this is something that could be done county-wide. It's what is a long list of things that would be nice if the county did. Mm -hmm. And of course, if, you, if, if we, uh, the county got the 44% from the deeds, uh, uh, from the uh, Registry of Deeds office that Barnstable got, it would free up 300% more money for the county to do things, but it would. How are you going to do something in a county like Plymouth, where it's? I mean, what do we have in common with Mattapoisett or Rochester or Lakeville or Middlebury? How many people have been to Middlebury? Uh, I think we get a few hands here, but uh, uh, it's different down in Barnstable, where you have uh, this homogeneous towns that have water, uh, uh, seashore, well most of them two seashores, two, two seashores. And so their water and the tourist is a common thing that they have to have good clean water and they have to cater the tourists. Now what do we have that combines us all? Uh, it, it's a different place. Uh, there are more uh, towns, municipalities, uh, that are on the seashore in Plymouth County than are. Uh, one, one of the things that Carl brought to my attention is that the, Metropo the MAPC, which we belong to, is an agency that can do these things as well, and in many ways, in a way that makes more sense for us because of our, or our orientation being closer to the metropolitan area, we have more in common with the MAPC communities than we do with uh, the Plymouth communities, and uh, many of these services could be delivered by the MAPC, and Carl even went so far as to begin discussions with them before they realized that they were, if they had this discussion, they would be tromping on the toes of the county, and they decided not to discuss that anymore. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Well, but, uh, you know, the, theoretically speaking, the, 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 MA, the MAPC could be doing these things for us as well. Well, it's interesting is that uh, MAPC is a regional uh, a regional area planning agency. planning agency. Well, in Plymouth County, there are three such. Uh, there's a uh, Serpard down in the, the Cranberry area, and Old Colony comes out of Brockton and goes over to Plymouth. And so the three of these, and they sometimes they overlap. Some are a couple in a couple of towns. But you take a a, a, a county like Barnstable, there's only the the uh, Cape Cod Compact. Cape Cod Commission. What's that? Commission. The Cape Cod Commission. Cape Cod, yeah, Commission. That's right. Yeah. Excuse me, Cape Cod Commission, and that's the one 
planning agency that goes over the whole whole Cape. And so, uh, the, the Barstow was a different place. And uh, Plymouth is like in four sections: Brockton area, the the north that's uh, oriented to Boston, uh, Plymouth itself, and then the Cranberry Cranberry area. I mean, it's not something in areas that we they all have something all in common. And, and if you could go in that section in the uh, in the uh, uh, proposed charter, you would see there are a lot of things that like sewerage. I mean, would we help? Would we do something countywide in sewerage? Uh, it just seems it would be very difficult if you trying to get Hingham together with towns around here. Try imagine trying to get Hingham involved with uh, Marion and uh, uh, places like that. I mean, let me uh, let me open up to my colleagues. Paul, uh, any comments or questions? Yeah, um, Laura and Carl, thanks very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I, I speak to my own experience with the courthouses. Um, as a young officer in the late 70s, I can remember traveling down to Wareham uh, District Court. It was a beautiful building, absolutely beautiful. Uh, now it's 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 really run down. Um, it, it's been a long time since it's seen any kind of uh, serious maintenance, um, which I think you know gives credence to your comments. Um, in terms of when the courthouses are going to close, um, you know I I did a lot of work in Hingham uh, back in the day, and and there were there were cars on both sides of the boulevard parked. Uh, the old gas station that used to be across the street was full. Um, you can show up there now just before 9 o'clock and still get a space. So, I mean, speaking to your point about it just may be a dollars and cents issue for the, uh, the court system to consolidate it with Brockton. Um, you know, Fall River just built a big justice center, Taunton the same thing. Um, Brockton has a, a Fairly new courthouse, very well run, um, bustling, and uh, wouldn't surprise me at all to see Hingham move to Brockton and Wareham move to Plymouth. There's a new courthouse uh, district, Superior, and probate. Um, there may be a housing down in Plymouth on Aubrey Street as well, same kind of thing. So, you know, if, if it's not a county decision to keep those courts open, um, if they're doing it by the numbers, the business, that may be a sign of things to come. Okay, thank you. Irma? Yeah. Well, I think this is a serious decision. I want to thank you both, because I know the time Laura's put in, and I know this is basically Carl's life. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate the time. I'm not so sure I'm ready to throw the county under the bus yet and pull out, but I am happy to see that you've changed from pulling out and trying to replicate the services ourselves to it's either work with the county and get it working or dissolve it. Now, in the minority report, um, how many towns signed on? I was trying to think, was it just five towns to not towns. dissolve? Dis to dissolve? No, uh, there was a vote. It's not towns, it's, uh, it's uh, people who were elected to the uh, Mm -hmm. uh, charter They're commission. elected from regions. Like and okay. there were only five out of the 19 that voted for abolition. But and that, are they the large ones? Are they smaller uh, ones? I think one fellow is from Duxbury and he takes, takes in Kingston. But it, you were Duxbury. Uh, Duck, Duxbury, Kingston, and something else. And oh, I think another fellow was from Halifax and down that way. Uh, I don't, I don't recall where they're from. But mm -hmm. it was a matter of the members. Mm -hmm. It's not a member, matter of municipalities. Okay, and I know it's percentage by um, area that assessed value by assessed value. value. Right. Um, I, I'm going to differ with, I think it should be a selectman representative to this group if, if it is the undertaking is something as serious as dissolving a county. And I know the time Ellen puts in, I know the time Sean from Duxbury puts in. 
if the decision is this serious, it ought to be a selectman attending the meetings. You can certainly appoint one of yourselves. Well, so be it. Um, and I want to thank publicly um, Tom O'Brien, Ellen, Dan Pallotta, the other two commissioners who have spent a lot of time with me and I'm just beginning to scratch the surface trying to understand this. I also want to applaud the new group, as you said, Laura, that is trying to change things. There's six pieces of legislation filing its way through the great and general court um, to leave more money in the registry so that it, it can withstand any of the changes but also be even more self-sufficient. So I think it's worth looking at. Um, I don't know the right answer. I would like, I grew up under a county government, a very diverse area. I grew up in Dade County. And it's just what you're describing as Plymouth County because you have Coral Gables and Bay Point and all of the very, very rich areas on the water. You also have very agricultural areas where um, south of Miami, where you could compare them to the Halifaxes and the other areas that grow a great deal of crop in our area. You have landlocked area, even though Florida has water on both sides. So it was a very diverse, very large county, and they were able to provide services. Florida starts with the county government. Yes. And so how do you get from a town government to a strong county government like you have in Florida? One day at a time. Well, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> and it's, you know, it is the struggle because nobody wants to give up power. That's right. And that's the issue. That's right. That is, that was the experience I was expressing yeah. earlier. Um, the, the answer was the, the towns didn't have enough financial resources to sustain themselves, particularly in the upstate uh, mm -hmm. communities. And uh, they had large cities generally in the center of the county that could step up to the plate, and that's why the county became more powerful and they provided countywide government. Um, but they still have volunteer firemen, by the way. They haven't solved that problem. And uh, so I think you, you make a, a good point. Um, I, Paul, I think you said you might have one more I did. question. I did. Carl or Laura, um, with respect to the other 30% of the state government uh, that's in county form. Is there a move afoot in the other counties to? There is in Norfolk County. There is. They're, they're ahead of us. In fact, the uh, uh, Brookline town government has voted to secede from Norfolk, Norfolk County, actually. Brookline. Okay. Brookline. So um, they're, they, they have, um, uh, they have some even more irrational aspects to their county government. They. <laughs> And so they, they have um, they have county engineering services, and you can Im you can imagine Brookline probably doesn't need any county engineering services. And, they have a golf course. You know, they and have a golf course. Yeah, yeah. They, and they, they have a, they own the county owns a golf course. Um, you know, I just I just like to say that I uh, I too grew up under county government. I grew up in Arlington County, Virginia, where there is no there, the county government is so strong there is no municipal government. It's not incorporated. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it, it's all really about history. Right, it's about, geography. because the, the towns here are so old um, and the town structure is so old and strong that there are powerful forces um, mitigating against uh, giving power to the counties. And when it comes to regional services, I really feel after my time on the Board of Selectmen that um, need creates it, you know, as you said, in upstate New York, towns couldn't support themselves, so they reached out and they got regional services set up. Um, towns uh, uh, will join together to do things regionally when it's in their interest and when they have a need. And I think that's the way to go, bottom up with the regional services. The, the sad part is everybody talks efficiency and everybody talks a good game about regionalizing things, but nobody wants to be the first one in to say, okay, I'll move my ABC and we'll centralize it. If the county w operated the way the county charter describes, I would think it would be lovely. But based on the history that we have here, I just don't buy it because they could be doing all those regional things now. But the, the issue that I have is the group that's in there now, because you can't change history. And they've given us exactly what happened and how they're gonna fix it. 
And I think uh, I applaud them very much when you hear that the audits they're trying to do are paper records that are boxed in different places. So I give them a lot of credit for doing that. And I like to give them some time to see if they can make it work. Because I don't think by, by dissolving the county, I don't think that's going to happen overnight. Oh, it's certainly not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I, I think what I'd like to propose is, um, first of all, I'm waiting to get the letter. So, Ellen, anything you can do to get the letter back to us in response to our questions? Um, I'm used to getting responses, and I understand this. Sometimes. Is what, yes, sometimes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to see this move, uh, moved along. It's important to us so that we have uh, input. Um, I also would like to suggest to my colleagues that maybe, as Laura had suggested, that we put some folks together to, uh, to put some numbers around what's the benefits and what's the losses uh, on this. And um, maybe each of us could come up with a name. And uh, maybe then we'd have two people at large. That's one thought, unless you all had other ideas. So there'd be five people, and we have a liaison, maybe Irma, since she has uh, an opinion for wanting this, that this might be a good way to help her. And you've already done a lot of research on it, so that would be a, a good thing. Sounds um, good. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't take long Thanks, for that. Paul. Is that a motion? Yeah, so moved. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I really think so because you have done some that, and I, I have as well. So, um, and then uh, I'd like to. I, Carl has given us a resolution. I'd like to us to uh, digest what we heard this evening and take that resolution at a come back uh, maybe in September um, to see whether or not we'd like to modify it or change it. And, uh, and then at the same time, start to get this group more formally together to see if they can quantify um, what the results would be. So, sounds good. Would it be OK with you if we ask Ellen if she'd like to say anything? Well, they, I'll give them a third night, sure. <laughs> no, but she's <laughs> no, been sitting she's here. been sitting here. Is there anything you want to correct or maybe editorialize on? I, and, uh, I mean, there are several things I could with a lot of time. Um, I would just point out that clearly there was a, a it was a 19 member commission that over the course of a couple of years and an amazing amount of time they all put in uh -huh. studying this question um, that the majority, I think it's 14 out of 19, um, came to a different conclusion. And so I think it's um, a real uphill battle for you to try to take things in the opposite direction from the commission. And, just in general, having been involved in what the county's trying to do with the state legislature, it seems that everything takes forever up there. So I think it's kind of a, a very long-term thing you're, you're considering. I, I commend you for figuring out that seceding is um, not probably a worthwhile endeavor. That would be extremely expensive for Pingham. Um, because then you don't have the registry being taken over by the state. You have to create your own. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's some services so that, that you're missing expensive. there. I mean, uh, the housing authority and the county just started providing services to housing authorities to help them get their um, OPEP calculations done and audits and things. It's very popular. Yours chose to join in. Ours chose to join in. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little more in the story than this. but. Well, I think what, I, what I'm hearing is, there, I, obviously there is, and that we, we need to get a, dot the I's and cross the T's, because there are also costs, as you just pointed out, that we would incur, and what's the, and what's the net result of, of that. Here's my fear, and I'd like to convey this, so this is my personal fear, um, and that is that there are services that I had seen on a list, not yet defined, as Carl pointed out, that would suggest that things like assessment or engineering and things that we do at the local level um, may rightly be done by the county because they could be and could be better done um, by a county group. But we need to understand that. And my fear is that government has a tendency to grow sometimes on its own without any, uh, any benefits that accrue back. So, if it does go in, then, and the answer is to go in that direction, something else has to go away. And that's the, that's the part of this that concerns me. Um, because we are a state that's shrinking relative to the rest of the nation. And therefore, 
we should be consolidating more the services we do, and that's one of the reasons to go with this. But on the other hand, uh, growing government is not the answer to our future. That just grows taxes. And I think you all know my position on taxes. So I think we should study this to be sure we quantify what that benefit is. And there should be a benefit, one way or the other. And I think I'd like to see that um, more uh, with more meat on it. And that's what makes me think. If we put a group together that of some people that we all know who have, uh, who have background with Hingham and understand the implications, that might be helpful to us. So maybe we could put it on the September 5th agenda, Betty. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, Ellen? Just one sure. comment in response to that. The assessments to the communities as a group are just are subject to Prop 2 and a half, just mm -hmm. like your property taxes here. So there's not a scenario under which Kingdom's going to see their assessment ballooning um, to cover new services from the county. If the county were to spend money providing more services, they would have to generate Wait. the revenues to provide those. Do something other than taxing, or assessing our communities and our tax payers. Yeah, and, and there is an implication, as I mentioned earlier, the Mayflower Group. Um, even though that's separate, um, you know, it's a relationship that we have. It to is, because the people who run the Mayflower Group are all county employees. That's right. By the county, so to act like it's completely separate is a misunderstanding. That, that's correct. I, and I just want people to, on the public. It's extremely well run. I, I, we, we agree. We're very happy we're in. Yeah, the, the we are too. We, we agree with that. Can so, I get one last question before I keep going. And no, go ahead. No, one last question. Then. One la <laughs> you mean my last before my last? That's right. Um, what does it mean to dissolve the county? What kind of vote does it take? Let's say we all agree. The legislature has to do it. And how do we get it to the legislature? And who's the we? Well, you know, there would have to be probably a compelling reason to do it, which is what there was when the county, the previous counties were dissolved. And the compelling reason could be that the county is bankrupt, and that would happen because the state has refused to acknowledge its responsibilities one way or another, not because of mismanagement at the county mm -hmm. level. Um, or it could be the people in the county one way or another express themselves saying we just don't think this is, works for us anymore. I mean relative to the proposition two and a half it's absolutely true however as you all know just as happens in Hingham when you have a more valuable you build a more valuable house than your neighbor your tax will go up more than two and a half percent the same is happening for us at the county our, our assessment has gone up quite a bit more than two and a half percent because our property values victims of our own success are rising much faster than they are across the county so we get an increasing share of it so um, you know maybe maybe that's it I, I don't know but for some reason Pete and Carl and I have been going around we went to Hull we've been we've talked to people in Middleborough we talked to people in Situate and uh, it would be people deciding at one by one or town by town that this is not for them anymore but Oh, and about uh, that two and a half percent, it seems to go up two and a half percent uh, assessment every year, except the years where we do a, a reassessment in town. And that went up 13.7 in 2012, I believe. Yeah, it was 13.7. I can't I confirm did. that right now. You, you gave me the figures and I figured All right. out. It's on, it's on one of my slides from last I just don't remember that. I remember a lot of things, Carl, but yeah. off the top of my head, I can't give you that. It's on, it's right. on the slides that I put up. All right, so why don't we'll come convene again on the 5th and give a chance to digest what, uh, what you've told us. And uh, Thank you very much, much for your thank time. You, thank you for taking the thank time you. and effort. Are you going to give us that? I know we've got we something have similar. No, we have the exact we have same one. Oh, we yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. I, this is just points from this. Um, it's just summarized easy so people at home could follow along. There's not really anything different. But yeah, Betty has it. That's great. OK, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you very much. My folder is ever growing for the county. The, um, the next item, I, I, something I want to bring to the board's attention. We don't have to decide this tonight, but um, it came to my attention um, that at a recent board meeting of one of our elected boards, that there were animals present in the, uh, and, and I can see Mr. Hersey brought a relative of uh, one of those animals here. Um, there were animals in the, um, in the room that caused a uh, upsetment to some of the board members who were participating. 
And I had thought that we had a policy dealing with animals in the building, but I was told that uh, we don't. And when I asked the uh, town ad deputy town assistant town administrator to look at the issue, uh, she found some interesting uh, diversity across the Commonwealth, all of which are the towns that she found, all had some form of restrictions in public meetings for animals. So, uh, Betty, I don't know if you have that list with I you. I don't have the list with me this evening, but there were a variety of uh, approaches to animals within the building, and uh, the ones that seemed to have the most consistent approach were the many towns had service animals service animals. I also spoke to Leslie Badger, the animal control officer, and she she said that because of, you know, problems with animals that she's encountered in various places, she she also agreed that some sort of policy was, was appropriate. And she she felt that uh, animals not on leash were a problem in any public area um, where, you know, they could run through a building or whatever. And she said she could she could see the the sense of a uh, service animal only policy within town hall. Yeah, I think I mean that's where uh, my daughter's a vet, and I can sh show you the scars that she has on animals that were supposedly under control, but are not. And uh, and it's not your animal that usually gets in trouble. It's the other animal in the room that causes the. Uh, the problem. So I, I thought we should uh, at least discuss the issue uh, because if I have somebody who serves on an elected board in fear, uh, that's an issue for us that we need to be sensitive to. So I don't know if you all have any comments on that, but uh, I thought we should at least discuss it. Well, I see Bob has got a stuffed baboon. John. John Hersey. Um, I'll speak to that in a minute. That's fine. I would just like to comment, though, because I've been to Africa where those things run free, and if you had an animal like that, hold it, that animal would rip your face off. And what I'm, you know, I, I hear you, but I kind of share Bruce's, uh, you know, observation that an animal, um, it's an unpredictable creature. You know, 99 out of 100 times, it'd never be a problem, maybe, kind of, but who knows? Who wants to be that 100th time and take a, a, a bite? I mean, if, if, if there's a compelling reason that you need an animal in a building, um, you know, they don't allow them in courthouses unless the people are blind. That's, so <coughs> that's my a good answer. reason for that. They don't allow them in most corporations either for that same reason. I know, yes, a lot of the I dot coms and stuff bring your animal to work so there is there is a softening of that policy um, I just I, I think a discussion is good I just don't want to see this as a vendetta against people I don't have a problem with an animal being on a leash um, having and I know John's dog is one of the most docile sweet dogs I've ever met I've been ripped up by a Doberman in case anyone wants to see my scars kind of like come and see my etchings come and see my scars wow. they're pretty healthy so I understand people's fear of dogs but I just want to put this in perspective yeah, and I, think, I, I like your I like your little animal John I think uh, you're putting it in perspective is a, is the right issue because if somebody gets hurt then that's a liability to the town and uh, that is the concern that I have are and you only doing dogs no, I think service animals. I just said whatever service animals. I mean, whatever that definition entails. Um, I saw a show on TV this week where uh, um, using for monkeys. ALS for ALS yep. uh, treatment, um, they are they are suggesting people have all sorts of animals. So I wouldn't restrict it. I just I think the general description of service animals, those are generally animals that have been trained to deal with it. So that's a the only. The only other pushback I'd say, and for discussion, the Rec Commission offers programs for training dogs. Um, we see all the little animals marching along with their owners. Mm -hmm. Where? Um, they do, seriously. Oh, where, though? Um, in the building, in the Rec building. Yep. Yeah. yeah and, uh, Leslie has a constant, because I'm always popping my head in there to see what she's got to pet 
or play with. Um, in the heat of the summer, people may choose to bring their animals in rather than leave them in the car. So maybe maybe temper, tempered here, but I think it's a good topic for discussion. Yeah, I don't. I, 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 I take a little bit of exception to your word, use of the word vendetta. Um, there is no vendetta here. This is about safety and being practical in government buildings. And um, uh, we should not have animals loose where an elected board member feels threatened by that animal's presence. Just should not be, whether that's a good animal or a bad animal. Some people have a natural aversion to it. This is a government, not a, not a veterinary office. And uh, that's kind of... I, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. Neither to be honest do I. With you. I mean, <laughs> but, but for the reason that I don't know why a dog's roaming around in town hall, period. Well, that's, that would be, I, I mean, that. I thought there was a policy. Um, that had it, as I thought, because I, the one I'm familiar with is uh, Patty Coyle's dog, which yes. she always had on a leash and was always under control. Um, but obviously that was not the case, and I thought I should bring it to the board's attention, because uh, if someone's uncomfortable, it's our job to, or doing volunteer work, it should be our job to make them comfortable, regardless of what our personal opinion might be regarding animals in question. I have a dog, for the record, um, I and I too. try to keep control of the dog when it's around people it doesn't know because I don't know how the dog's going to react, frankly. That's, that's exactly the issue, that uh, animals can get out of control despite the best intentions. Well, I'd, um, I'm going to bring this back um, for a discussion by us because we're responsible for this building. And um, in the same vein, um, it's brought to my attention that um, People are bringing, there are two people I know who bring bicycles into the building. And I'm advised by, uh, by uh, our, our safety folks that that's not where they keep them. It's not a good place. They should not be in the building. We, in fact, Laura was here when this happened some years ago where we purchased bicycle racks for bicycles to be locked outside. That's fine. That's why we do it. But they should not be in the building. I think that's a simple one. Um, I'm concerned again about if they're placed in a in a in an area where um, it blocks access or egress for, to a building. We should we should not permit that. So that's a simple policy to. Uh, yeah, to I fix. wonder I wonder where that is because I know I've seen bicycles in the alcove, kind of tucked away, well, that are not anywhere near anywhere people are walking. It's a fire hazard by definition. Am I right, Mr. Alexiotis? Correct. We, we, we've just looked the other way. We've been looking the other way. So that's not right. OK. All right. So think about this. We'll bring it back. Yes, Carol? Like internal dogs are all animals except service. No, we said service animals. Yeah, not just a service animal could be any animal that a, a, Are you saying no dogs or any animals in the building unless they're service animals? That's correct. Time? That's what I'm suggesting. We no should. No animals at all. Yeah, except service animals. Right. Yeah. What about the dog training programs the rec has? That's in, they bring them into a town-owned building. Well, we'd have to explore that as part of the procedure. I didn't know they do it downstairs. I see them outside on the field regularly, but if they also do it downstairs, then we'd have to consider that as part that's of the policy. part of the issue. We'd have to look at that. That's, a, that's why it's a discussion. Okay, Mr. Robert, yes. Um, yes, John Rissi, Um You have a problem with two wheels then, I guess, huh? Is that, is that where we're at? Bicycle, you have a problem with? No, I said where they're located. Yeah, they're located. we have a place for them. Yeah. Well, um, how about wheelchairs? That's that's two wheels too. Would it be a no, problem? Wheelchairs are four wheels. Okay. Um, so you're not talking about health. We're talking about bicycles. Okay. So you want to ban bicycles in the building? Is that what I just hear? Storing them in the building. Storing them in the building. Okay, fine. Do you feel as though just the citizens, the public, is clumsy? I mean, do you, you think that, or do you think all, all walks of jobs are... You, you obviously weren't listening to me as usual. What I said was that bicycles in the building present a safety hazard. I hear what you said. That's trying, what I said. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, 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 trying to get, I'm trying to get to a point, okay? If you're saying you don't, like, you don't want bicycles because they could be a hazard, okay, then when we have toys for tots in, in, in the Christmas time, okay, then we can't bring them in the police station, okay? They've got to be banned, okay? You have, to, you have to notify every single police officer in this town that, by the way, from now on, you're not allowed to pick up a bicycle and bring it to the police station, okay? That's not allowed, okay? I think that's very short-sighted, 
Okay, and uh, as far as dogs go, I have no problem with that because the only reason why I brought my dog in was because Patty Coyle brought her dog in. But now she's not cheering anymore. I don't have to put up with that anymore. So I have no problem. As far as my friend here, it's an it's a African dictator uh, monkey, okay, from Africa, and it's not a baboon, and his name is Larry. He's got a brain the size of a pea, okay, and uh, that's where we're at. And I think there is a little vendetta here, okay, because of my dog, okay. What's and the matter I, with your dog? I bring my dog in. That has nothing to do with this. Well, I, I, I think there is. And the only other well, thing I disagree with you, and I take go, exception to your even mentioning it. Is Tom Patch brings his bicycle t in, in the building. So th that's where I'm at on the issue. Okay, Mr. Rabuco? Does Rabuco? that have to do with Mr. Patch? It has a lot to do with the issue. Okay, thank you for your opinion. Yeah. It's worthless as usual. Are there any other questions? Selectmen in town administrative reports? I am. Um, would like to bring up the issue, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, regarding the um, town hall cafeteria and ask uh, the board's indulgence and in, um, the assistant town administrator has been working with uh, the town accountant and the town clerk to see um, if we could maintain the town hall cafeteria, the school department, which has been running it through the school lunch program for, um, I think, since the inception of this building. Um, has said that they can no longer continue because it continues to run at a loss. And um, based upon um, Betty and Sue and Eileen's calculations, it looks like um, we could run this ourselves, um, but right now our, our initial projections show a loss of um, about six to $7,000 per year if we were to maintain it. And it's a current structure. The school department's agreed to leave all the equipment in place until such time as we could uh, replace it with our own equipment. Uh, we did a small survey of uh, all, town, uh, depart all town employees within the building. Uh, we got a very good response. Um, I don't know if Betty if you have the exact numbers, but um, uh, we, we got about a 70% response in favor of keeping um, the uh, facility open for town employees. Um, I know we try to create um, activities that don't generate uh, losses, but um, in the area of employee benefits, I think you know my recommendation to you would be it would be worthwhile to try to maintain that service, um, e even though uh, it's a small loss. We would like to try to reduce that, and we think we could by um, uh, increasing uh, some revenue, by increasing some participation, and decreasing some costs. Currently, we've been generating about twenty-five thousand dollars a year in revenue, and um, uh, in order to keep keep it going, we we, we would need another six thousand dollars of uh, of um, of budget capacity. The, um, uh, the one of the issues on expenses that the uh, lady Doreen, who's w running the uh, facility, has indicated to us is that she buys all her food supplies through the school lunch program. So that's bulk purchasing um, for the schools. That works terrific. You know, they have a lot of mouths to feed every day for lunch. Uh, we don't quite have that volume. And we don't have 4,000 students that we have to feed lunch to. And so um, sometimes those bulk purchases are not as effective for us. We have to buy too much, and some of it has to get thrown away. So you know, it doesn't stretch as far. You don't get a meal out of every, every bit. So she would like to start you know, using more local suppliers of food, try to keep her costs down. And um, I think, uh, like I said, I think it would be a good process to keep forward. The reason I'm bringing it to you through my town administrator report is um, uh, today was the last day for the school department. Um, and so um, effectively this will shut down um, starting next week if we don't continue it. Um, if I had your okay, um, I would uh, uh, continue it and um, look to fund the deficit through some other area of our operations. I'm sure somewhere in our budget we could find the six or $7,000 if we can't reduce our costs. What did your survey show again? How many? About 70 percent, 69 percent, I think it was, uh, in favor of uh, the facility and keeping it. And I think we got about 70 responses. Uh, it's a pretty good total as to, I'm not sure the exact number of people we have in the building, but it's pretty, pretty close. Questions? Um, I went up and looked at the survey today. Because I'm open to this. Right now I'm not exactly in love with it. Um, and there was really no question that said, are you in favor of keeping the cafeteria? It was, do you buy lunch or not? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, I went through it and I said, well, I can't really answer this. 
because um, occasionally I'll have lunch here. But then the question presumed a yes or a no answer to start and then a go forward. Here's where I'm, as we talked yesterday, um, Doreen's going to work X number of hours. She was going to do her own procurement. Is that on company time, our time, or her time? And as she shops around, who owns the liability? And does she get mileage? Is it her car? Is she going to use one of our company cars, if you will? So I think there's more things to flesh out here. And I'd really, I'm assuming this will be a separate, totally separate budget, not buried somewhere. So we will see the entire finances. On this. We can certainly separate it out. I mean, it's a, it's a fairly small operation and compared to what we're talking about. It's $25,000 a year activity for a $90 million budget. So uh, I would propose running it through the town hall budget where we run our custodial services and other services. Um, in terms of uh, um, some of the questions you, you, you asked, Irma, um, you know, I, I, no, we would not be giving a 20-hour week employee, um, which is what this this person would be, um, a car. They would use their own vehicle to go back and forth, and um, uh, we would work out either a mileage or a delivery service. For example, if she bought things from Stop and Shop, they have delivery capabilities. So uh, I think we could step around a lot of that stuff, and we'd look to arrange a merchant account to maintain some level of control um, over the purchases um, with with a local grocer. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, Ted spoke to me about this this afternoon, and um, I think the concept's a good one to, to keep a, a gathering place for the uh, uh, people who work in the town hall. I think it's good for morale. Uh, frankly, I think that the, the, I mean, this is just subjective, admittedly, but um, it, it gives a chance to socialize some of the, the, the work projects that the different people have here. And frankly, I think it gives them, you know, more time. I, I assume it's a defined lunch break that people have here, or is it? When people have an hour lunch, an hour lunch. and, uh, you know, usually they take it between 12 and 2. Okay. So, it, I mean, the concept to me is a good one. And, and I'd be in favor of keeping it in place. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure the administrator could could monitor the uh, the costs, and if it became something that was problematic, we could revisit it. Um, but it it seems to be a, a popular offering in town hall, and um, I mean, we have the same concept kind of uh, integrated into the zoning bylaw up in uh, South Hingham um, for the office space area in, in the Bristol property where. We allow a small amount, a very small percentage of of that office space uh, devoted towards, you know, some kind of business offering where people can stay within the campus to get their food and whatnot. Um, I see some uh, parallel here. I I think it's okay. I don't think anyone's saying doing away with the lounge area where they eat lunch. This is the purveying of food. Um, I think it might be interesting to keep it, do it on a trial basis for three or six months. Um, so there's continuity. But if it was losing money under the school scenario, I'm not sure that even with buying on a smaller scale that it's going to make money or at least break even. I want to be clear. Uh, I'm not suggesting it is going to break even. It, it likely will continue to lose money. Um, um, I, I want to say that I think that's okay. Uh, an employee benefit um, to keep people in the building, especially during the winter months, um, for a few thousand dollars for the level of staff and salaries that we have in this building is, you know, to me, a, a very marginal employee benefit. And I, I can't think of any um, progressive modern company that doesn't try to provide these levels of services to their employees and a lot more but of course we're government so we're not going to compete with the Microsofts and the Googles and etc but certainly good management practices and modern uh, human resource um, um, uh, provisions uh, suggest that this would be a good thing. In addition 
a lot of people use the facility um, from the rec department and from um, uh, uh, service or people who use the rec services and the um, and the Council on Aging Senior Center come up have a cup of coffee and um, yeah we could use vending machines for that but there's a um, collegiality about having someone in the uh, in office um, sure. I know that uh, I know that Doreen did um, you know meals catered towards Weight Watchers for some people who wanted to pursue that and um, you know got you know got a lot of uh, enthusiastic support from the employees who are working on that so uh, I, to me I would say uh, even if the expectation was that we are going to lose money the question is how much and you know for me I've, I've sort of drawn that number in that in that five to six or seven thousand dollar range where I think that's reasonable I mean we're, we're paying twelve thousand dollars a year for people to have um, um, debit cards for their medical flex leave um, and we think and that's an employee benefit that we're giving so for, for us to do this you know I, I don't think that's an unreasonable uh, a benefit well certainly the way this kind of crept up on us <coughs> um, uh, it, it is a benefit and to your point um, you know the, the better run companies today provide that kind of facility um, and it does accomplish, you know, uh, a collegial atmosphere. But more importantly, it's to the advantage of the of the company, because people don't take an hour, or, or they use that time. Those that avail themselves of the facility as a way to get a meal. And I know of some companies where, uh, you know, if people work late, they insist on you're not getting a sandwich that you voucher. I'm sending you out to dinner, because you're staying to work for me when you're on a salary. So that's uh, those are the better <coughs> organizations. I think uh, you need to get some questions answered. I think Irma raised some good questions. Um, but I think we need to continue this open, and, and we don't have a line item in the budget for this. Uh, Correct. This year, it didn't happen that way. So we need to get a resolution to it so we know what the next step would be, because if it's only a few thousand for a couple of months, uh, we need to get that resolved. So maybe you could come back to us in October uh, mm. Do whatever we that need. Would be good. Yeah, do whatever we need to keep it going, so that it's transparent to the employees, and then come back with a more detailed. Uh, so, just to be clear, then what I would propose is, um, um, you know, we're going to post a job for the current employee. Uh, well, actually, for the position, um, it'll be an internal posting. Anyone, of course, in town can apply, but you know, likely the person who's doing the job right now would be uh, uh, leg up on anybody else. Um, and uh, I will apply to the personnel board for a classification of that position um, and, um, and that's really all we need to do to go forward um, and I'll continue to track it and watch those expenses and report back to you yeah I think you may have to in the posting you might have to indicate the, the, that there's a timeline to this at the moment I mean if, I think to the question temporary yes to, to, to make it uh, a bridge so you get the answers Correct. and we I'm in favor of keeping it. I'll be very blunt. I think it's a good thing and I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my colleague has some questions and I think those questions deserve sure. to be answered. So let's uh, let's handle it in that way. So put it on the agenda for October. Okay. Okay. Is that giving that you That would give it about six weeks, six, yeah. eight. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So you have good. a good feel. Thank you. It. Good. Okay. Okay. We have some votes. I think some votes. All right. Um, let's see who went last last time. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think I have the the cluster of a name. So, Mr. Healy, you get an easy one. <laughs> uh, let's the, see. Uh, the South Shore Model Railway. I'll uh, move that we approve the request of the South Shore Model Railway Club to install a storage shed on the property. Second. Any further discussion? All those did, in favor? Did um, did Mark Duff take a look at this, and did um, Chief Perino take a look and have any issues with uh, the storage shed? I suspect not, but I thought I'd ask. I did speak to Captain Damstra. The huh. reason for the shed is um, they have a lawnmower that they store, right. and okay, good. they don't want they don't want to store something with gasoline inside the building. Okay, so all so those in Kevin, favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, the street lights on North Street, Mr. These are, uh, um, it's a request to waive the electrical fee. It's um, a town job, town, town, town project. 
I have questions. I have been Don Quixote on these lights. I've actually thought of going and getting the signs that said, let there be lights, since the day I walked in. We had a meet. Can you, a little bit more information on this? We had a meeting a couple months ago mm -hmm. with Roger and Paul Henu, and Roger had a couple little things that needed, like fixing before they could energize and pull the wire. We were told all the work was done. Can you help here? Th this is actually the uh, electrical connections, I understand, that, okay. that uh, the light plant essentially has to apply for to make the connections. And so this, the permit fee is for the light plant. Is it for an electrician? It is or? an independent electrician. Is Ooh. this the guy that operates out of an unmarked SUV? And the only reason I say that is because I had to ask somebody who he was. It looked a little strange doing. I don't know what his vehicle looks like. I'm not sure who's are doing we, the work. Are we sure this guy has insurance and liability he's required and all the? To, he's required to furnish proof of insurance to the building commissioner before. And they've seen this? They, they, Bruce, can they do that before they issue the permit. The votes first. OK. Hold off on the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I can't get you the answer to that, okay. but I will. Well, I can it, get you the answer. I don't have it today. You can get it after but, the fact. But so has this guy been working without a permit? I'm not sure if we're talking about the same work okay. related. This is, you know, standard vote for waiving a project, waiving the fee on a town project. Okay. The, the it's only like we reason, did the school department waiving the right. fee on the, no, the, the middle school. That's just, all this is. It just gets my little ears up because I want those lights. I, I, I don't know the specific contractors doing the work. Okay. I, I can ask can Roger that and I can get that for okay. you. Yeah. All right. I'm good. All right. So it's my turn. I move to waive the electrical permit fee for the street lights on North Street. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, I'll uh, let's go. move to approve the issuance of a special one day wine and malt beverages liquor license to Sergio. Pungitore? Pungitore for the light for the lady of light picnic at Barbudo's Cove Pine Street on Sunday September 1 2013 with a rain date of Monday September 2 2013 from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. second any further discussion all those in favor aye we make a motion that the board in connection with the purchase and sale agreement dated June 15 2013 between Nancy Noonan as seller and the town of, Sing of Hingham as buyer, the agreement in parens, ratify an amendment to the agreement requested by the Conservation Commission and agreed to by seller on August 13, 2013, which amendment extends the town's inspection period until August 28, 2013 and the closing date until September 11th, 2013. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Move to approve the temporary rental of the unit at 21 Back River Road, Perens Back River Town Homes and Perens until such time as the Condominium Association has amended the master deed to allow Fannie Mae to approve the buyer's mortgage. Okay. Uh, just as a point of clarification, that we expect that to be in November. Is that what I was told? Yes. Yeah, November. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh my Second. God. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Ted, on the last one, could you um, explain uh, how we got to this one? Uh, I'm familiar with it, but I want to make this is the, one, the appointment of Nelson Ross. Yes. Um, so Nelson has uh, stepped down from the personnel board, um, so they don't have a spot for him. Um, but um, he's assisting us with negotiations, really. Um, in an assistance of negotiations, but also some training to show some of the newer members of the personnel board um, how perhaps one of the best labor negotiators I've been told top five in the country. Um, my experience with Nelson, of course, as you well know, is, um, and I think you all know him as well as I do, that um, you know he's second to none in helping us in these things. And um, he's asked for um, the same type of coverages. Um, personal liability coverages that he would get as a personnel board member. The only way we can do that is to, according to Labor Council, is to appoint him as special liaison uh, for labor negotiations to, 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 uh, to me. And um, uh, since I sit in the negotiations and, and Nelson's fine with that. Okay, so that's good. This will give him his protections Thanks. and keep him on. I think it's great. Good idea. The other, the other issue is he is, I mean, I know I've talked to some of the members of the personal board, and to replace his experience is difficult. 
but we got to, you know, Mao Tse Tung took that first step. We're not going to do not it. that Nelson is Mao Tse Tung. Yeah. And, and we're doing that. If you, if okay. you see right now, we're doing three negotiations, and these will be the only three I believe he's doing. He's doing the DBW negotiations and the police patrolmen and superior officers. And um, what he's doing is he's walking through that whole process with the members of showing you know, how we set up those negotiations. Right. Should this have a time limit on it so that we, um, I don't want it to be an infinitum. Uh, you know, we'll oh, be done. Or do we? We'll, we'll be done within the end of the year. So, so why don't we say through December 31st? Well, no, it'll take longer than that. Uh, to the end of the fiscal year. Okay. So I mean, it's likely contracts could go. I mean, I hope, we all hope that we could settle all our contracts in the next couple weeks. Always appointment. Okay. But, let's but through the end of fiscal 15, 14 would be. 14. Uh, all right. So. Um, okay. Let's see. You got that, Irma? Did yep. you get it? Okay. Yep. To appoint. Uh, I make a right. motion to appoint Nelson Ross as special liaison for labor negotiation matters for the town administrator through the end of fiscal 2014. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we have one last vote. Uh, okay. I'll move to, to uh, sign an employment agreement with the assistant town administrator. Second. Any further Second. discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, if I could just make one comment. Um, I, I want to publicly acknowledge the work that Betty does. Um, um, I was able to take two weeks vacation, and Betty you know, stepped in. Um, I, I got three calls, um, which is remarkable over that two-week period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, too, for clearing the air on that um, and keeping people away from me. Um, but uh, Betty um, has a breadth of knowledge, and, um, and, and um, uh, is, is incredibly valuable and I just I want to let the taxpayers and the citizens know just exactly how much uh, you know, quality work she provides to us and I'm glad that she's willing to stay with us for another three years. That's great. Thank you. That's good. Well, thank you very much. much. Betty. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Betty. Thank you Betty. Okay. Um, select many other reports Mr. Town Administrator. That's it for me. Okay. Irma? I have three things. First, um, Paul and I want to thank Lincoln Maritime for a great selectman's regatta. Paul and I graciously let other people win. <laughs> I just Someone didn't fall in. in. That's <laughs> all I'm happy about. Well, the terrible thing is, I'm the sailor. Yeah, that's right, I was too once. Um, <laughs> Paul and I had a wonderful time. Lincoln Maritime is a crown jewel of our harbor and our town. and. I heard a statistic thrown, given out by Sturt, so we want to recognize Ellen Dresser, Sturt English, Jenny Gray, Rick Padoni, and I know I'm going to forget people, so go ahead and send me the emails. Uh, they've taught about 10,000 kids, young people, during their tenure here so far. They provide fun for summer and training and skills over the summer, plus jobs for a significant number of young people. And it's skills that you keep learning and you can keep using. And Paul and I have a lot of work to do. Uh, we want to thank our crew, uh, TJ Manning, who was my crew, and Cameron Tedeschi, who was Paul's crew. And they deserve some kind of a medal. <laughs> but as the Red Sox say, we'll be back next There's year. always next year. That, right. There's always next year. Um, secondly, tonight, uh, James Gordon, or Gordo as we all know him, is holding a fundraiser for, to raise money for the Jimmy Fund 26 mile marathon walk on September 8th. So if you want to donate, it's a little late, they might still be there, probably not. Um, you can go up, Google the Jimmy Fund, and then look for Team Gordo. There's six people going to do the walk. And we also want to wish Gordo the best of everything as he leaves for Plymouth State very soon to start his college career. So go get him, Gordo. And last, lastly, um, legal services. Something I'm going back to my advisory days. And I did a graph. Um, this, our legal, and I'm not quarreling with the goodness and why we're spending. But our legal expenses have grown rapidly since 1997. And thanks to Sue Nickerson, who gave me a couple numbers I didn't have. If you look at the trajectory of the graph, they're uh, of concern. All money has been spent well. So what I'd ask, just so we don't lose sight of this, two things. That the town administrator give us a summary, three-minute summary, 
once a month to keep us in line with where we're going. And also, as we go into this budget season, to perhaps give consideration that was kicked around at advisory, that maybe, as you see this graph, maybe it's time, as we're changing as a town, to consider a part-time in-house counsel. And in fact, I think, Bruce, you and I had discussions a thousand years ago that maybe it's time to consider that. So I throw that out there now, way at the front of the budget season. That's it. Okay. Um, let me just, uh, we did, um, about a year ago, look in-house. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to one, just to, you know, you're right, we should discuss this, but just to, just to educate uh, what we, we did look at, going back to one size fits all is not uh, the where our future lies as, we, as the law becomes more complicated. And, and for the price that we want to pay, um, we could get lawyers at 80 or $90,000, if I recall, but we would get 80 or $90,000 worth of law. So there are some, but the good question you're raising is, are there simple municipal functions that could be formed that wouldn't be uh, required? And I certainly think it's worth re-examining because we should re-examine all of our budgets all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we, we will include that in, in that issue. So, Mr. Healy, any comments on anything? Any uh, sure, I'll just comment briefly. I, I enjoyed the, uh, the comments of uh, Senior Counsel of Holland and Knight, uh, who sits as a member of the advisory board, um, complimenting uh, our litigation counsel on the complaint that was drawn up uh, with respect to the, the water company issue. I thought that was an affirmation of uh, the quality legal work that was performed and continues to be in, in that matter. Um, but beyond that, I think the two of you have pretty much said it. Um, I would just like to add that I continue to visit. Uh, last Saturday I uh, met with the uh, Group 3, Hingham Fire. Um, pleasant chat. Um, I continue to monitor the, um, as, a, as a civilian, in a civilian capacity, the, uh, the dispatch center. I uh, had a, um, uh, an inquiry made to me by a citizen over the past week. I uh, sent an email to Ted and despite the busy schedule he's got upon his return, I got a detailed response. Um, it gave me a breakdown of the times with respect to the response and the deployment of units. Um, I'll speak with him in further detail, but I think it's an ongoing process of continuing to work to improve the dispatch center. Um, that's something that uh, I couldn't help but think about when uh, Laura and Kyle were making their presentation about kind of the town's bottom-up responses to certain needs. Um, Dispatch Center is certainly one of those. Uh, it's not county oriented. And I'd just like to close and um, I'd, I'd strongly recommend to the uh, citizens to uh, Google the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. It's fascinating reading and I think it's well worth it. Um, you know, Mr. Foss has long since left this world, but his contribution um, during the Spanish American War. Uh, it is, is memorable and significant, and I, I truly hope that, um, you know, the, the recommendation of uh, Mr. Claypool's uh, group, as well as our own affirmation of it, is supported uh, by the people. Thank you very much, and good night. Thanks, Paul. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, um, I, I don't want to take credit for uh, the speediness of the response, Paul, because I was merely the conduit and I want to give credit where it belongs. Uh, Maureen Shirkus is the Director of Operations for the Dispatch Center. I forwarded your email to her and she got it back to me as quick as I got it back to you. And th that also shows me that they're starting to be able to use their reporting side of their equipment to kick out that kind of information so we can find out what's going on. Yeah, that was good to see. All right, let me, uh, first of all, uh, I have, um, when I put on your calendars at, and I talk to the town administrator, we have a revenue forecast meeting, um, I think tentatively scheduled for September the 17th with the personnel board and the advisory committee. 
before we have that meeting, the three of us should convene to cement our suggestions as to what we present. So um, I'll ask the town administrator to kind of set up a date for us to have that. Okay. We've got work to do, I know, before that's ready, but sometime after Labor Day. And um, it's extremely tentative, the 17th, because I have not had a, yet a chance to speak with the advisory chair who's out of the, out of the country. So I haven't spoken <laughs> to the personnel board of the school committee because no, if understand. advisory can't do it, might as well not talk to the others. So no. it's extremely tentative right now. Yeah, it is. And I will find out on Monday. And that week, we're, if it works, we're going to have just the one meeting. We'll, we'll, if, if that works out, so we'll do it the 17th. Correct. Your schedule is set up to have a meeting that week on the 19th. And um, if we have a joint meeting with advisory, my recommendation to you is to move your meeting from the, the, the 19th to the 17th. Okay. Um, unless I'm you want to have that. two meetings that week. Okay. No, we're not we're on the trial on the 19th. In today's uh, Hingham Journal, there was a very nice article on a, uh, an event that I know Irma and I went to back in uh, July, um, and it was a memorial service for a, a citizen of Farm Hills, Steve Kelch. And I had meant to mention this before, but uh, uh, to, to give recognition to a man who was truly very, very, um, uh, very, very uh, helpful to the town on working its way through so many issues for Sound, South Hingham, coupled with all the military work that he did, not only on the Veterans Council, but in service to uh, the Massachusetts National Guard. So uh, our condolences, but it was a wonderful celebration of his, of his life. Um, ben Burnham is a name that has come up for discussion and appointment, and I've had an opportunity to talk to Ben. and. Um, he is willing to accept an appointment to any committee that would uh, serve one or two years. He, he thinks that would fit with his initial work plan. So uh, I didn't know, Paul, whether you're, com since he's a contractor builder, uh, whether he would be helpful to uh, your idea around South Hingham, or if, Irma, if you had any other thought he his his constraint is he doesn't want to serve for a full term on any committee just one or two years um, so I didn't so I didn't know and let you all think about that but he's willing to accept to be to stay involved and I think good you know, that's he's a, a good he's man a good man he yep. is a good man well let us get some give some thought and let's see what vacancies are around yeah there is on your desk I had asked uh, Betty Tower there is an August 13th list and uh, um, you know the other is whether he could be, learn more about the town from a financial uh, point of view by being on the tax classification committee. Mm -hmm. I think either of those two would be of a temporary nature. So uh, I'll ask you for that. Um, there is, uh, I think you all have seen the email, but the public may not, that there is a warning from the Department of Health for triple E. Uh, we are at the moderate uh, uh, standard, moderate level for the town of Hingham, um, someone in, uh, in Weymouth, I understand, uh, uh, was uh, uh, st stricken with triple E this past week. Um, and uh, so just to be attentive to that, but more importantly, they are trying to uh, arrange for a spraying of Hingham August 28th. So if there's a rain date, if that, that would not happen if rains that day, but it is something that's on the uh, on the agenda to, to occur. So I wanted people to be aware of all of the recommendations that people follow in a triple E area. And then I see in the back of the room the deputy chief of police uh, who pretends he's not here, but he is, and therefore to him I will convey a happy birthday. Oh, to, wow. To the police academy. Yes. To the police. To the, yeah. to the Hingham police who on August yep. 12th celebrated their 106th birthday. You don't look a day over 25. <laughs> Put on your glasses. <laughs> I think I gave that, you the gray that hairs. Is that Glenn back <laughs> there? I think I gave him the gray hairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Still his hair color. Yeah. So, uh, so that's it. And the last issue I had is a procedural one. Um, We, we, I know what you all would like to go to, we all would like to go to a number of meetings where our liaisons are present. And um, if we post a meeting, that becomes an opportunity for two people who go to collaborate. Uh, it certainly doesn't say you can't go to the meetings, you certainly 
can and that doesn't need to be posted if um, you're going to participate, but you cannot vote. And I think by posting it puts temptation in front of any one of us who might be there with another on another issue. So um, just want to have that uh, laid out there. I think that's the procedure we should follow that's in the best, uh, uh, best keeping. So certainly go to as many meetings as we all like to go. Um, I know Laura's idea about uh, what to do on the, on the Plymouth County, that has merits because there have been three or four meetings that I know of where they have conflicted with ours. So that's another. I, I just need to caution the board members that if you're not posted and more than one of you show up at a meeting, it's not merely not voting. You cannot discuss any town business. Um, if either of you discuss town business, even if the other one doesn't say anything, the um, the Attorney General has ruled out a violation of the open meeting law because one person is talking, the other person could be hearing, you would expect, and uh, that's a conversation. So um, it's, it's literally extremely difficult for you know, that kind of activity to go on. They are, um, as, as we did tonight for the first time, um, now the open meeting law requires us to describe the subject in more detail. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and I thank Mr. Keyes for that uh, question because how does he know what to ask as to what happened if he doesn't know what we discussed? And while we don't have to publish uh, as, as what, what happened, uh, it's important that we identify it for the public so they know that there was, in a, in a general way, what the item was for discussion. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else that we've taken care of all the votes, Family Fun Day. Is it this weekend? weekend, Sunday. Sunday. Yay. Yay. Yippee. You're welcome to join into the poem. Yay. <laughs> All time closet. Oh. <laughs> that's uh, fun. Yeah. It is. I think that's the, the highlight of uh, all the kids. I've had a and the adults. Home myself, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So what time is that uh, for the folks at home? Uh, I believe it starts at 11 o'clock. Is Spider-Man coming? I'm not quite sure. All the dogs going to be leash, Glenn? No. <laughs> 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 Leslie's coming, though, right? We've got Leslie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And with that. <laughs> so with that, um, thank you all. We'll see you on September the 5th. And all have a happy Labor Day and enjoy. Yes. Thank you. A motion to adjourn, please. Second. All those in favor, aye. Thank you and good night.